Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. This meeting to order. And Ms. Thompson, I think you have the honors. Okay. Well, I'm going to give a small little very important quote tonight because of if you just look at, look at our world right now, just pray for our world. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on to them to do the same, or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was like in the United States when men were free. Ronald Reagan. Let's bow our heads. May we always have wisdom and discernment, Lord. May we always be humble and have humility. May we never forget the sacrifices so many have made for our freedom. In your precious name I pray, dear Jesus, amen. amen. Let's amen. stand and honor our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Sheriff, would you join me in honoring some of your finest? I'm going to read a uh, recognition from the Alamance County Sheriff's Office for uh, Officer Kevin Hopkins. On July 10th, 2021, Officer Kevin Hopkins was waiting for paperwork in the ARMC Emergency Department area. While there, Officer Hopkins observed a male patient struggling to breathe because he was choking. He immediately began performing the Heimlich maneuver, which dislodged the item that the patient was choking on. The incident was witnessed by ARMC staff who stated that while there were numerous medical staff present, present, Officer Hopkins did not hesitate to act immediately and assist the individual before any of the working medical staff knew that the incident occurred. Due to Officer Hopkins and his quick response and knowledge, this individual was able to receive sufficient life-saving measures. Congratulations, Officer Hopkins. I'd like to present you the life saving award to be presented to Officer Kevin Hopkins in recognition of your actions that resulted in life saved on July 10, 2021. Thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. Here is your life saving pen to go on your uniform, young man. Thanks. And thank you for being the officer you are with the Alamance County Sheriff's Office. Aww. That's right. <laughs> And uh, commissioners, we'd also at this time like to uh, recognize and honor our clerk to the board. So, Tori, if you want to come up here and stand beside the chair. I have here a letter from the International Institute of Municipal Clerks and the letter reads on behalf of the Board of Directors it is my pleasure to inform you that you have been awarded the International Institute of Municipal Clerks designation of Master Municipal Clerk. Included in this package is your hard-earned MMC certificate 
as well as your MMC lapel pin. We know you will wear it proudly. The International Institute of Municipal Clerks grants the MMC designation only to those municipal clerks who complete demanding education requirements and who have a record of significant contributions to their local government, their community, and state. In light of the speed and drastic nature of change these days, lifelong learning is not only desirable, it is necessary for all in local government to keep pace with growing demands and changing needs of the citizens we serve. We applaud your educational accomplishments and achievement of this milestone and congratulate you on your personal pursuit of professional excellence. Sincerely, Sherry L. Pierce, President of the International Institute of Municipal Clerks. So, all right. Very good. I just want to say what a super, super job this lady has always done, and she keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> she keeps us all out of trouble and keeps us pointed in the right direction. Yes. Thank you, Tori. <clears throat> I assume we're only doing one officer. Uh, yes, only one was available this evening. All right. Okay, I assume we have one public speaker, that being Susan Henry. Yes. Oh, right up, huh? <coughs> Top of the order. Hi, Susan Henry. And, and I'm have, here to speak. You have three minutes. Okay. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from you. And it is all, something on the agenda, correct? Yes. Excellent. Yes. I'm here to speak about the um, COVID emergency leave pay. And my understanding what it is, because I'm not an employee of Alamance County, I'm a retired teacher and love being retired. But um, my understanding of that leave was a, a pot of money that um, our Alamance County employees could use if they were ill with COVID or maybe close contact with COVID um, so that they could reduce the spread of COVID by staying home and not have to utilize all of their own sick leave. So that's where I'm coming from. And correct me if I'm wrong <laughs> on what my interpretation is. I'm gonna breathe for a little bit. <laughs> Even 30 years of teaching and up around, but kids are a little different than adults, you know. So I would assume that the implementation of the COVID emergency leave fund was to help reduce the spread of COVID in Alamance County by encouraging infected employees or those in close contact with somebody that had COVID to stay home even if their leave balance was depleted or if they they wouldn't have to use and deplete their leave balance because being a former teacher we get sick a lot because being around all of that so it was a wonderful intent with that it is an um, if in fact that is the intent of the fund then what difference does it make whether an employee is vaccinated or unvaccinated, since the CDC states that even those vaccinated, unfortunately, are still spreaders, so we still haven't mastered this yet. I think it's still an unknown area. If the intent, is the intent of emergency leave fund to reduce the spread of COVID by allowing employees to stay home without financial hardship, or is it the new idea or is it to reward those vaccinated or punish those unvaccinated so that that's my question for the commissioners today is the intent of emergency leave fund to reduce the spread of covid by allowing employees to stay home without financial hardship or to reward the vaccinated or punish the unvaccinated if <laughs> because I wasn't in the room when it was decided, if the intent of the emergency leave fund is to reduce the spread of COVID, then why the dis possible discriminatory practice of allocating to some and not to others? If this financial safety net is removed from the unvaccinated, 
how can we be sure that they would stay home if they even think they're infected or have been around close contact with somebody? Wouldn't this compromise the original plan of the use of the COVID leave, um, emergency leave fund? Would that not compromise it and then therefore possibly not have the mission statement of reducing COVID in Alamance County? And I really apologize. Yes. Uh, we have a limit and we Oh, am I over? Yes, ma'am. Am I over? Okay. My suggestion would be to use the funds equally for all or eliminate it. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm a talker. <laughs> You're fine. Let, let me just quickly, as a commissioner, respond. One, we don't do anything for the teachers. That's done by the state oh, no, and by the school for, board. Oh, I understand that. So we don't do that at all. I'm speaking for public health, our public health employees right. that would be using this emergency fund mm -hmm. but what my interpretation is tonight it will be presented to the to the board and we have not yet voted so right nothing's so happened this, yet right so i'm just <laughs> giving public comment that i find and we find it discriminatory if you do vote for it and, and we thank you <laughs> thank you very much okay any other commissioner responses all right okay um we need to um approve the agenda mm -hmm. i'll make a motion that we uh accept the uh the Senate agenda i'll second it any other comment all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. okay it's unanimous mr carter i think it's unanimous is is steve carter online yes. with the i am i have i was muted sorry i Okay, then it's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, okay, we now have the consent agenda before us. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. So moved. Uh, have a motion. Do you second? Second. All right. Any other comment? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Again, unanimous. Thank you. Steve, you're the loudest one in the room, if I could tell you that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good for <laughs> Okay. You just hand that down. Thank you. Thank you. Master Chief. Okay, Mr. Haygood, I think the uh, Judicial Advisory Council, or Jack. It's being presented by uh, Heidi Norwick, is that correct, or Sky Solomon? It's uh, Heidi Norwick, and is Heidi joining by Zoom tonight, Bruce? Yes. Okay, great. Right there. Okay, you ready for me? <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> there I am, wow. Good evening, commissioners and uh, Manager Haygood. Nice to be with you all tonight through Zoom. Um, I am here uh, representing the JAC Committee, Executive Committee, and I am the co-chair of the JAC and we have a candidate who is interested in joining in a newly formed position as someone who has been formally justice involved. Um, in your packet you have that we received three applications. Um, one of the applications, one of the candidates or person requesting to join does not live or work in Alamance County, so we did not consider that application. And the other did not meet qualifications, so tonight we, um, the executive committee approved the appointment of Krista Knight, and we ask that the commissioners um, agree with us on that appointment. I know her, she is amazing. She's doing a lot of um, work right now, the diversion at the jail, and yes. just, and with her church, they do drug addiction, just phenomenal young woman. And I'm so glad to see her be pointed to this. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. I might also indicate that Ms. Thompson is on your board. Yes, so that's that correct. Pray for them. Um, <laughs> we are. <laughs> Any other comments? Okay, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, unanimous again, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, Mr. Atkins. Yeah, I think you're up twice. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> right now remember, you're talking to me. <laughs> don't be using big words because I don't understand. Well, I, I will try to to break it down. I find that in the morning I'm a little bit feistier, but by the <laughs> evening I'm starting to slow down. So it'll all work out well. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for having me here tonight. Uh, this is the presentation of the annual settlement uh, plus some additional uh, business that we have to conduct. And I'll jump right into the settlement, see if this works. Yes, it does. So, for 2020, and that's the tax year ended June 30th of this year, we had a total levy of $90,554,193.12. Of that, we collected $89,374,815.50. That left uncollected $1,179,377.78. That is a collection rate of 98.7. So the question at this time is always, is that good? How does that compare? And the first thing that I always look at is our history. So now, if we look at the past five years, it is an increase off of last year, and it brings us back pretty much equal with the 2018, which is the year pre-COVID. Uh, now still, that's a little bit off of our peak, and uh, I do want to talk about that later on, what we're seeing, and still some kind of ramifications of COVID that we just we can't quite shake. We have COVID long haulers, unfortunately. Um, but if you look at the five-year average and median 98.74, 98.71, we're kind of in that ballpark. So for me, it, it's not a standout year. It's not a bad year. That's if you look at the last five. Now, if you look over a longer period of time, this tracks back to 2000, you can see that there's a general pattern of decreasing collection rates until 2008, which is the low. From there, a general pattern of increasing collection rates. So even kind of an off year is still one of our best years. And another way to illustrate that, this is uh, that, that same time period sorted from the highest to the lowest collection rate. So this, what I'm saying is mediocre, is mediocre for the last few years, but it's actually the fourth highest that we've had. So it's a good collection rate. I feel confident with it. Uh, there's definitely room for growth, which we'll, we'll talk about in just a minute. And the other way that I like to evaluate this is to look at similar counties. Now, how do we find similar counties? So I start with a report from the Department of Revenue, and they break all the counties out by population. We're in the largest group, the 100,000 plus population, so I start with that as my comparables. And I'm an appraiser uh, by, by training, and so I think about these as comparables, and I'm making adjustments and whatnot. Beginning there, I weed out the mountain and coastal counties because their economies are so driven by tourism that they're, the way they think about revenue sources is a little bit different, so the way they approach property taxes can be a little bit different. I don't know if those are good comparables. I pulled them out of the data set. With what we have left over, the next question I've got is, is this a really rural county? Is this a really urbanized county? Can I make a good comparison? And so I find the valuation per capita per population as a control for how rural it is. And I also look at the median household income, because if you look at the trends, the more wealth that is in a county, the higher the collection rate. And I think there's association there. So I want to match as close as I can for household income. Now, if I use those as my standards, then my top matches are in order, Davison, Pitt, Rowan, Randolph, and Catawba. Now, uh, historically, when I bring you collection rates for uh, neighboring counties, they're actually one year out of date. And that's because I like to use the Department of Revenue certified numbers. And those are always one year in arrears, but they're final audited numbers and they're complete data sets. I don't have difficulty getting to those numbers. Well, last year was the COVID pandemic. I don't think it's a good idea to look at last year as, as comparative. I want to see this year. So I did reach out and get current numbers. I can't get one for Rowan. Uh, their computer system is not cooperative. Uh, as of the time I talked with their tax administrator, they had not closed the year. They did not know what their collection rate was. So for them, I went back two years to get pre-COVID, because COVID skews things. But if I look at those as comparables, then we have an average of 98.68, which is basically where we're at. 
Now it ranges, the, the low of 97.65, high of 99.45, I'm, I'm envious. Uh, but again, it, it's pretty much right in the range uh, of our similar counties. Uh, the amount collected, I just find this fascinating. So we collected 89 million, that's 2 million more than the prior year, which was 12 million more than its prior. So that's a 14 million pickup on general fund only. We, we also collect some municipal taxes. We do all the fire districts. Uh, and so we're definitely always seeing this growth of, of volume that we're collecting. Uh, but this is important uh, to me because most of the report is on the current year collected. This is the other nine years because we're not just collecting one year, we're collecting 10 years at once. And if you put all of your focus on the first year, trying to get that as high as possible, and then you let all this back year slide, you're going to end up writing off more than you have to. Now, our next item is going to be a write-off, but it's as small as we can get it. And so I do like to see what we're doing in back years. And as you can see, it is neck and neck with the prior year. By percentage, we're actually better, even though we're about 1,800 different by dollar. And so we're, we're trying to keep on top of that. And I think that that's a healthy sign. So the COVID long haulers. Last year, uh, I really thought, okay, we've had our COVID year, we had to stop collecting, and, and, and then we're gonna get back to normal. We geared back up. And the first thing we ran into is the Postal Service. In January, when taxes become delinquent, we begin mass enforcement. We can send out hundreds, sometimes thousands of garnishments at once. And we do this in January to get the ball rolling, to get those paychecks tapped. Well, in January, unfortunately, they were 30 days out. We were routinely getting mail 30 days from the postmark to when it was delivered. Now I have a problem. If I run a mass enforcement and I garnish people that paid on time, but it just can't get to us getting through the Postal Service, right? We're not going to take that risk. We're not going to do that. So we had to push back our schedule by three weeks. And three weeks doesn't sound like a lot, but if you know the, the rate that we gain collection percentage, three weeks at the end is about 10 points. That's the difference between 98.7 and 98.8. So for me, that's an important distinction if we get delayed by three weeks. Uh, that was an unexpected challenge, but the bigger unexpected challenge, and one that I cannot quantify for you, I, I don't have an estimate for what it does to our rate, is that we have our regulars, the folks that we see year in, year out, Every year we garnish, and that's how we collect our taxes. Well, this year we send out the garnishments, and we get notices back from a lot of employers. Well, this person doesn't work here anymore. Okay, well, we call. Can, can you give me a lead? Do you know where they've gone? Because I need to find their new employer. No, they're, they're sitting at home. They're collecting more money from the COVID funds than they used to make working for us. They're sitting at home. Okay, I can't garnish your COVID funds. We got desperate. We said, well, we're going to go after a bank account. Let's, let's hit the bank account. Protected federal money. So people I've been garnishing for 10 years, and we'll garnish the next 10 years. This year are immune. Uh, can't get to them. What did that do with the collection rate? It's lower, but I, I don't know how to quantify that. But one measure that will kind of illustrate. So. 2017, 2018, this is our peak year, 98.91 is the highest rate that we have on record. I don't know of it ever being higher. We did 4,348 enforcements. This year we did 4,720, but the rate went down, 98.7. So it's not for lack of, of trying, it's not for lack of hard work. And I say this because my team has worked just immensely. They have poured themselves into this and done everything that they can. It's not a lack of hard work. But when you repeatedly hit that brick wall of you can't get a wage, you can't get an account, then that's, that's the challenge that we face. But I'm proud of my team. I think that they've worked very well, done a good job. What does it look like for the future? Well, that depends. Uh, I'm hoping that we're going to get back to normal sometime. But of course, I, I looked at the news this morning and saw mask mandates in our bordering counties. And you look at the sit reps and you see the escalating case counts. And I don't know what to expect. 
the more this prolongs, the longer it takes for folks to get back to work and get back in a normal cycle, that will hamper us because I can't garnish a wage that doesn't exist. Uh, so I, I don't know what to predict. But we're poised. If we can get some form of normalcy back, I think we're going to have a record year. But we have to get past those roadblocks. Uh, do you have any, any questions regarding the settlement? Is there a statute of limitation for garnishment? Mm -hmm. Ten years. Yep. So what was missed this year due to all this whatever will go into next year and there'll be fees and all kind of stuff Interest, like that? Yeah. Wow. In, in, in a long-term sense, collecting in later years is not a bad thing because we're getting about 10% interest. So it's, it's not super harmful. But we prefer to collect it early, not to collect it late. <clears throat> um, we will get it sooner or later. Now, other than the settlement, there's some related items. Let me flip over here and find my next one. And one is exactly what we're talking about, that there's a statute of limitations 10 years. After 10 years, I can't do anything to enforce. Now, we can keep the, the indebtedness on the books. If someone has a change of heart and wants to come pay us, we can take the payment, <laughs> but that's unlikely. And so, typically, after 10 years, we go ahead and write off whatever we were unable to collect. As of September 1st of this year, 2011, we'll be passing out of our reach. And so what I'm asking the board for is a motion to um, go ahead and write those off, whatever is not uh, collected by September 1st. We will uh, usually send out a flurry of garnishments in late uh, August just to see what happens. <laughs> but after that, we're, we're out of ammo, and we just write those off. As of the uh, end of the fiscal year, our 2011 stood at $92,800.49. Given the, the size of the first year, to get down to 92, we, we feel we've worked about as far as we can. So, and so I am requesting a motion to allow us to write that off uh, come September. And I understand that we'll need two separate votes, Mr. County Manager, is that correct? Is that correct, Jeremy? Two um, votes, one for the uh, one, charge off. One vote for this, and then one vote for the next item. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. yeah. I'll make a motion as to both both mm -hmm. items. Uh, let's take the first one. Mr. Atkins, uh, list the first motion for, for us, please. Well, certainly. So what I'm requesting is that any 2011 taxes that remain unpaid September 1st uh, <coughs> be allowed to be written off. And I make that motion. Uh, and I just want to clarify: it's the uh, you, it's the ninety-two thousand eight hundred number that you're looking for. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I second that motion. Mm -hmm. Will you have their name wrote down somewhere? Yes, <laughs> every last one. <laughs> I hate that for people. I just did. But you guys did a great job. I mean, you're thanks really to the numbers that you yeah. are dealing with. You guys did a good job. Did the best you could expect. Thank you. Any other discussion? <clears throat> All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. And your second motion, Mr. So, so, so the, the final <laughs> item in, in this set of, of uh, things to talk about, the order of tax collection. And so what I'm asking for is the board to give me, it's called the charge, and it uh, basically empowers me to... <laughs> You used some pushy words a while ago. You said ammo or something. Now you're charging. Okay, go ahead. Oh, my word. Uh, I, I'm telling you, it's, it's late in the evening. I'm already going to watch you every day. He wants a license to kill. Thank you. Do we issue those? Do we issue those? Uh, the order of tax collection. So what it does The short is answer is no, by the way. No? No. Uh, it empowers me to use my statutory remedies. And so for the 2021 taxes that we've just billed, in, in order to be able to garnish and, and enforce the bank attached to levy to do any of that, I need to be empowered to do so. Now, generally, that doesn't start until January, but there are special cases that can start early, I mean, even now. And so, rather than waiting, we have traditionally gone ahead at this juncture, empowered me to do so, so that if something comes up, I can immediately act and not have to wait for the next meeting to be authorized to act. I'll so. make the motion for the order of collection. Mm -hmm. So, any other discussion? Mr. Carter, we're not leaving you out, by the way. <laughs> oh, I'm doing good. Okay. 
All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, Senate. again, unanimous. Thank you, Thank sir. You. So, so the next agenda item is unrelated to the, the previous. Um, this has to do with our 2023 revaluation. Uh, in order to complete that revaluation, one of the, the critical things that we have to have is a schedule of values. And that's it's a pricing manual. It's kind of our Kelly Blue Book. It's where we turn to to see how we need to make adjustments and how we need to approach the valuation problem. In 2017, uh, our schedule of values was written by two persons. I wrote the residential schedule of values and our commercial appraiser wrote the commercial schedule of values. And I'm very happy with the way that that turned out. I feel very confident with the schedule that was written. Uh, that commercial appraiser, he had years of private uh, practice experience. He had years with Durham County and years with us. And unfortunately with that many years, he then retired right after the revaluation. So we don't have him to call on. Now, we do have a commercial appraiser on staff uh, that was trained by this individual, assisted this individual, and took over after him. He's had all the commercial coursework that you need. I feel good about him as our commercial appraiser. But there's a difference in the amount of experience between the routine day-in, day-out work and writing a pricing guide for every type of commercial in the county and then being, being responsible for every type of commercial in one fell swoop make sure everything is equalized. That's a different level in scope. Uh, I think that it would be appropriate to get outside <coughs> assistance to do that. I think it's necessary to get outside assistance to do it. I know that I can. I know enough about commercial to be dangerous. You don't want me trying to do that. And so we put out an RFP to uh, solicit vendors who could uh, support and provide that for us. Uh, and it's both the commercial schedule of values and also valuing commercial property. So it's actively appraising plus building a schedule of values. Now along with that, um, I think that it would be important for this person to also work on the residential. Even though I did that last time, this is a different animal. I don't know if you've seen what's happening in the market, but the difficulty is that you don't get to wait for the moment and say, yes, this is the set of values I'm going to use. You have to call the shot way ahead and say months from now that's where the market's going to be. And that gets tricky when it moves this fast. So I think it would be very wise to, to let this person with more experience work on the residential as well because I really think that's fundamental to getting a good revaluation. So with the RFP, uh, we had three bidders. We reviewed carefully the um, various references that the bidders provided. Plus. I looked at who they worked with for the last five years and talked to a lot of folks that they didn't use those references. I think those are more interesting. The reference is going to say something nice about you. I want to see the one that you worked with and you didn't include as a reference. Mm -hmm. So between the three, I put out 58 counties that I asked for feedback. And uh, based on that feedback, you know, I, I, there was definitely, to me, uh, a front runner. Looking at prices, I think there's definitely a front runner. Going through the interview process, I think there's definitely a front run. So what I'm recommending to this board is to enter into a contract with Vincent Valuation. I think that they're the superior bid between the three, and, and they're the ones that I prefer to go forward with uh, on this project. And I believe the uh, contract is in the packet. It is. Now, it is capped at 250000 over two years. Uh, but that doesn't mean we're going to spend two hundred fifty thousand. It's we'll spend as much as we use of that. That's as much as I wanted to make sure to have reserved. If we were to need to spend more than that, which I do not anticipate, then I'd have to come before this board and ask for authorization to do so. Uh, my actual estimate is more in the range of two hundred to two twenty, but I wanted to have a little bit of play because I'm not exactly sure between here and there what we're dealing with. Uh, it is a, a flat rate for the schedule of values, and it's a per day rate for the commercial appraisal. And that's where it depends how much we'll actually end up using. I don't know, but the 250 is a cap. Jeremy, how much did we pay Mr. Retired? Mr. Retired? Oh, goodness. I mean, is there a big difference between, like, him and you compared to this company? That's a good question. Yes. Oh, oh it's definitely more. It's yeah. definitely more. The company is more than the two staff members. I'm yeah. sorry. Um, I understand this is the only bidder within the state of North Carolina. Yes. The others are from out of state. 
and how did this company, you've already indicated much better, give me some idea how much better they were pursuant to your uh, contacts and references. Well certainly, and that really carried a lot of weight for me because uh, you, you get to use them one time and then you see your results, so you don't get to say, hey, I didn't like that when you used somebody else. Well, you've already wrecked a reval if that happened. So I don't want to learn from my experience. I want to learn from someone else's experience. And when I reached out, like I said, I, I started with 58 counties. Now, not all 58 responded, but a significant portion did respond. Um, with that, with some of the other bidders, it's what you expect. Mostly positive responses, some mixed responses, some negative responses, but that's exactly what you would expect to find. Uh, with Vincent, it was 100% positive. I didn't have one person come back with any negative comments. And in fact, in two counties, they had used both this company and one of their competitors and favored this company. They said that it was a superior job and they would use this one over the other one in future uh, revaluations. And so that speaks a lot uh, to me. And another thing that I find I think is very important uh, too is I've got a lot of confidence in uh, Mr. Vincent, who's the uh, company's owner. Uh, you know, he is an IAA instructor, which may not mean anything to anyone else, but when I take classes for appraisal for, for mass appraisal purposes, these are the people that I go to learn from, and he's teaching these classes. Uh, a lot of his, his background and specializations work very closely with us. Uh, he is extremely experienced with OneTax, which is our software program. And so to have somebody who is already expert in my software, that I don't have to train my software so that they can use their appraisal skills, is a, a definite plus uh, for me. So from, from many perspectives, I, I think that they're a great, and I don't want to speak ill of any of the other companies. I think they're all three great companies, but there's just a real difference in fit and a trust uh, for, for this one, that this is the one I would use. What states were the other two bidders from? So one was in Virginia, and one is dual headquartered. A lot of it's in Ohio, a lot of it's in Texas. All right. Don't you think a North Carolina company would have a better idea of Graham well, and LMS County? Certainly. And, and, you know, trying to reach out for references with some of the others, I had to go out of state to talk to folks in other states. With this one, they're all clustered right around us. And again, a lot of them are on the same software that we have, which is convenient to me. Uh, when I built the schedule for 2017, I had to conform how I approached it to how the software thinks. I, on paper, this is what I want to do, but this is the language that software wants to talk, and I've got to talk its language. So to have someone who's already familiar with how that works, and building a schedule is an advantage. Absolutely. Just one more question. Okay, last year mm -hmm. it was you and Mr. Retired. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Retired's gone, and now you're looking at these people. So tell me the difference between why it should not be you and it should be them for both. Them for both. Like why would you want to step back from this <coughs> if you've been doing this, mm -hmm. and then now you're wanting a company to do the whole thing? Mm -hmm. So uh, last time, and just to answer your previous question, I think maybe more accurately, because I've, I've been thinking about what was that you were asking? Good Myself luck. Good plus luck, our Jeremy. commercial <laughs> appraiser uh, would probably be more than what we're paying if mm -hmm. you're talking both of us combined. Okay. But versus the commercial appraiser alone, obviously we paid that individual less uh, than what we pay uh, for the total uh, service package here. Um, but. There, there's two issues. One is I definitely have to have help with commercial. That, that's not my thing. Uh, I work with it a little bit on appeal. If you can slow me way down to focus on one property and give me a lot of time to dig on it, I'm more comfortable. But you'll never get the job done. Yeah. Not, not close. I need someone that doesn't have to slow down, someone who's, who's very comfortable with that, very familiar with that. On the residential side, um, there are some challenges, I have to admit, with the way that the, the market is moving very rapidly. Uh, makes me a little bit nervous. Um, but I will be completely, uh, I, I have Will a, you be in their business? Hmm? Will you be watching these people? Well, you don't know, yes. <laughs> look, look. Well, I mean, hey. Th this is the reality. and. and one of my faults is I'm overly transparent, so I can't help it. It's, it's the way I'm, I'm, I'm made. Um, there's a reality that a bad revaluation ends careers. 
and I don't want to go anywhere. I really enjoy it. And this was important. This, yeah. this, this right reevaluation is extremely yes. important. It's probably more important than the yes. previous two. Yeah. And so th this is the deal, is this has to go where I'm afraid I go. So I will be all over top of this. But that being said, to, to take on the scope of the work, I don't have a cloning machine. I, I, don't, I don't have 60 hours a day. I just don't. And one more thing. And, 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 oh, I'm sorry. I, no, it's, say I got this little house, mm -hmm. and it's probably worth sixty-five thousand right. dollars. But now when I sell it, it's like three hundred fifteen thousand. Right. They don't pay the three fifteen stuff. Like, no. I don't. When you talk this eval stuff, you're not going to make people pay more, are you? Well, no. It's, it's not about the actual bill going up. Now the okay. values may go up pretty substantially. So we're looking at a lot of stuff now running uh, where we're at seventy percent of market and falling. By the time we get there, I have no clue where it's going to be at. So the the value number may be a huge pickup. And that's a scary word, but I'd rather people but be prepared. But you know, it's people have lost their minds over how much they're selling things for. I could sell my doghouse probably, and I'm not kidding. I don't understand it, but God bless everybody that can do it. But at the same time, I don't want that to cost everybody. You no, know what I mean? Th but this is the thing, is then that higher value comes to this board. And with that tax rate going into a revenue neutral stance, this board controls where the tax bill goes. Okay, so we can say no. Well, no. think about it like this, Pam. Um, and Jeremy, correct me if I'm wrong, because you and I have talked about this. Mm -hmm. It's so, some way. It's going to take both of y'all to help. With it. Okay. You know what's not all, what he's talking about is extremely important, but there's like a couple of other things that are involved that it will, will bring even more money into the county. We haven't even talked about the public utilities. Oh, absolutely. And those will bring in more money than our residents will bring in. We have to get the PUCs corrected. So that, those are the ones who are dictating our, re our reevaluation, right. not the residents. Yeah. The residents okay. would like to know okay. what their value of their property is, I'm certain. Um, you know, or tell me if I'm wrong. I, I think we're going to get more money from the public utilities oh, yeah, companies that, than we will ever get from our residents. That, that's, that's the crunch that we're under, is mm -hmm. that they look at our percentage valuation and then they start docking us our public utilities. That's where the 400000 came from. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly it. So that's what we're trying to get, get restored. That we had to pay back. We had, and we're going to have to keep paying them until we get this done. Right, yeah. exactly. Additionally, revenue neutral is a major term that he just used. Yeah. We then set the tax rate to make that be something comparable. So your, your tax bill is not going up, so but your, your, value, your, your rate will go mm -hmm. down. Okay, it's like this. I buy a roast right. in mm -hmm. June. It's like eight ninety eight. Okay. Now it's $17. It's yes. the same cow mm -hmm. walking on the same ground, eating the same grass. Right. He didn't all of a sudden get a PhD. Right. I don't, that's just not right. So for, for the value basis, that will probably go up really substantially. For the bill amount, what someone's going to write us a check, that, that comes to this board as to what you want to do with the tax rate. If you go revenue neutral, that check's mm -hmm. going to be about the same check. It'll be the same check. They'll yeah. write the same check next yeah. year as they did this year. Yeah. And you'll have a vote on that tax yeah. rate. And the tax rate, we get to set. Okay, I'm good. We got it covered. Um, I'm, I've lost my place. As I did that to people. I'm sorry. <laughs> that is completely. I'm okay. all over the world. I'm. I was, but it scares to, me. To answer, to, to finish answering the, the the question that you asked, I want to make sure I answer it. Um, it's a matter of time. If I could press pause on the rest of my responsibilities and become your reval guy, I'm on it. But. While I'm doing that, the tax administrator guy has gone away. And if I'm if I'm running day-to-day -day operations, I can't run the reval. We don't have a button, sorry. So, so I mean, so that's that's the deal. Is is I simply don't have the the amount of time it takes to, to wear both hats. Okay. Um, what are you doing? Hey, hobbies. <laughs> I don't have any experience with that. I mean, I <laughs> okay, I'm just I just this is uh, oh, okay. That's good. I make a motion? motion to. I make a motion. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Craig. No, you can make your motion. I do have. Some I was going to make a motion to uh, give Jeremy what he needed uh, for his uh, reval. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good idea. Go ahead and ask your question. I, I'll second it, but I, I do have just a couple of questions, just for, just for clarification. Yeah. And this may be for Mr. Albright. Uh, is there no legal requirement to do reasonable, or lowest responsible bidder for this for this contract? Legal requirements is Clyde. Not for service. Okay. And for Mr. Haygood, is uh, is the two hundred fifty thousand dollars? for this contract included in the budget already? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Mr. Atkins, when when would the uh, reevaluation process begin and, and what is the target date to say 
this is the date that we're projecting the values are, are set for. So they're effective as of January 1st of 2023. Okay. Now, they probably aren't going to be done on the morning of January 1st, 2023. We'll probably be sending those out more in the vicinity of March 2023. Okay. But they will be effective as of that date. So you're always looking forward, and then afterwards, you're always looking backward to that date. Uh, as far as reval as a process, it's currently underway. We're in some initial stages right now. But we can't begin in earnest without the schedule. The schedule is kind of a, a, a well, you talk about getting your data clean, which is where we're at right now. But then the schedule itself is when you kick off. I can't value anything until I have a valuation manual to go by. Okay. I don't know what my rates are. I don't know any of that until that's established. Uh, and, and when would the board, maybe Mr. Haygood, I guess, when would the board make a decision about tax rates, assuming that we wanted to have a revenue neutral tax rate? When is that decision made? To, to offset the increase as of January 1st, 2023. It's part of the budget process. So when the budget is presented to the commissioners, it's required by law to demonstrate to the commissioners what revenue neutral tax rate is, right. which we work with Jeremy to make sure it's very clear to the commissioners mm -hmm. and all the public. So you've got the, the values changing, possibly going up. Right. We work with uh, Jeremy to determine that. And then when you, uh, through the budget process, you'll be notified the revenue neutral property tax rate is X. Right, that is that is the rate. That's the budget process for in 2023 or 2022? 2022. Yes, 2023. And that deadline is June 30th of that year. Mm -hmm. Yes. Of 2023. 2023. Yes. All right. So people will see their, their taxes go up 2020 in January, but the, but then they'll have to wait and see what the, what the commissioners do for the tax rate. But I, I think that everyone on the board is pretty much uh, agreeing that we need to have a tax revenue neutral Absolutely. number. Um, last question is, we, we talked about one of the benefits of moving up the revaluation mm -hmm. is that if there is a significant decrease in the value of properties, mm -hmm. um, there's, there's some leeway to yes. wait to do this yes. so that there can be a recovery. Mm -hmm. um, if, if that were to happen in this process, can we put Vincent on hold uh, and then pick back up later once there's, there's time for that to fall out? Mm -hmm. I mean, is, is the, does a contract require that this be done in these 12 months, or is that something that we've accounted for? So, so the way that, that it's structured, as the opener, we're going to get a schedule of values, because I don't know how we put a value on anything until we know what those base rates are. Right. Now, there is a little bit of overlap. It's not surely clean, but if you think about the schedules is leading, and then the actual uh, property by property valuation is, is kind of trailing. So as we go along, for something to happen, we would be in that trailing portion. All we have to do is go, oh, stop, pause. We've not agreed with him. Like the, the 250 is not that we're going to spend 250. Right. The 250 is really control on me that is a responsibility to this board. I can't go over 250 without having to come back because it just burned through my contract. And that's to keep me accountable. Uh, at any point when we just say stop, we're not obligated to, to finish out anything. And so we could pause regroup. Now costs, this is the other side of it, costs would certainly go up because at that point, if we had some sort of a crash, right. you'd have to redo some that schedule gets redone. Right. There's no way you could make it work otherwise. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Carter, any questions? I think Steve went on a coffee break. <laughs> Okay. Any other discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. It's <laughs> unanimous. Once again, I was on you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. That's funny. The next item on the agenda is a real, real pleasure to take part in. Mr. Haygood, would you help us with Mr. Gatewood? Dr. Gatewood. Dr. Gatewood? Give him up to the podium. Mr. Chairman, do you want to, would you like for me to read this resolution? Please, if you would. Okay. So, we have a uh, resolution before the commissioners uh, proclaiming Alamance Community College ACC Day 2021. Whereas Alamance Community College, established in 1958, paves the way for students to earn degrees and certificates in more than 40 <laughs> educational programs crucial for success in the 21st century and 
whereas Alamance Community College has pushed ahead of sister institutions over the past 63 years when it comes to innovative ideas, including the first data processing program in North Carolina and the nation's first two-year biotechnology program, and whereas Alamance Community College has committed itself to capital construction projects to better serve our students, including the Advanced Applied Technology Center and the upcoming Biotechnology Center of Excellence building, and whereas supporting and advancing the workforce and economic development of this county and surrounding regions is at the core of all that Alamance Community College does, and as a result, the college willfully partners with a wide array of business and industry that includes textiles, metal and materials manufacturing, biotechnology, commerce, and state-of-the-art technology. And whereas Alamance Community College has committed itself to strong educational and business partnerships with the likes of Elon University, the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, LabCorp Incorporated, Ferry Stone Fabrics, and GKN Driveline. And whereas the alumni, students, employees, and friends of Alamance Community College should take pride in all the accomplishments and future endeavors of the college. And whereas Alamance Community College has, since 2016, designated the first Friday in August, following the beginning of the fall semester as ACC Day, as a means for alumni, students, and supporters across Alamance County and beyond, to pay tribute to the role the college plays in the educational life of the community. And whereas ACC Day falls on Friday, August 20th, 2021, and whereas Alamance Community College respectfully requests the Alamance County Board of Commissioners to permit the college to install and display a banner on the courthouse lawn in the city of Graham that signifies August 20th, 2021 as ACC Day. Now, therefore, we, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners, call upon all citizens, supporters, and alumni of Alamance Community College to take pride in this educational institution on ACC Day and do hereby permit the following. The commissioners will permit the historic courthouse property to be adorned with a banner provided by the college that celebrates ACC Day. The commissioners will permit said banner to be displayed August 16th, 2021 through August 23rd, 2021. Signed, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. As you can see, we've already signed it. Thank you. 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 All right, and we've already signed it, by the way. Yep. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> we didn't have to make motions. Mike mentioned in order to display any banner or anything of the sort, um, by our policies and laws, we have to have a resolution, and that's why we're so pleased to be able to allow you to do that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Dr. Gatewood, I think you're before us again. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Gatewood, are you going to tee that up? So we have a uh, request, commissioners, from the community college. You're going to receive some information about uh, two of the college's proposed education bond projects, the um, Center for Excellence project and the Student Services Center project. These are both uh, education bond projects that were part of the $39.6 million uh, slate of work to be done at the community college. These are the first two bond projects. The commissioners voted to um, uh, issue bond debt for these projects uh, in April of this year. So the college has been diligently working on both of these projects and is here to talk to you this evening about some of the uh, difficulties they've run into, particularly cost-wise with, uh, with both of these projects. As you can imagine, and what we're hearing from construction projects around uh, the county and the state, uh, increases in construction costs are pretty widespread. So I think at this point, I'd like to ask Dr. Gatewood to please come to the mic and go over this information with the commissioners. Thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you um, very much, Mr. Haygood. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, first let me thank you for signing the resolution. I should have sent the request for this funding in advance. Maybe we would have been ready too. <laughs> Um, I have with me tonight Tom Hartman, our Associate Vice President for Administrative Services, who is 
over all of the building construction projects at our campus. And I will add for the record, does an, an outstanding job with that. I also have Matt Brunell, who is the general manager for the Christman Company. And the Christman Company is the CM at risk for the Biotechnology Center of Excellence building. Note the Student Services building is a design build project, much smaller project, much simpler. So we did not use the the uh, CM at risk model for that. It, it hurts me uh, to be here tonight making this request. And, and let me tell you why. From the very beginning, I have insisted that the staff and, of course, myself work within the budget that we had for the Biotechnology Center of Excellence building and for the Student Services building. The last thing I wanted to do was to come back to you and say we need more money. We had everything down to the T, if you will, in terms of the estimated price for these buildings in place prior to COVID-19. We went so far as to hire a third party estimator uh -huh. who worked with its construction manager yeah. and we worked with our staff to make sure that we had the cost right. And I submit to you this evening that we had our figures right. Mm -hmm. That is what we wanted to do. That is what we wanted to do in terms of respecting you and, and the public here in Alamance County. With all of that said and done, COVID-19 hit. And as Mr. Hager just indicated, the escalation beyond the escalation that we had already seen, it came into play. Now that I want to, if you would allow me the time, I want to just walk through each of these buildings to explain why we are over budget by the 1.9 million on the student service on the Center of Excellence building and 500 plus thousand on the student services building. While I walk through this, essentially what I would do is explain to you what we've done and some of the things we did along the way to make sure that the prices came in with the in budget. Center of Excellence building. The very first thing we did was to reduce the footprint of that building. The building was originally planned for 34,000 square feet. We got that down to 32, 33,000 square feet. And that was a savings. And we were within budget. Originally, we had planned for a parking deck which would have cost about $8.5 million. Unfortunately, we had to cut out the parking deck. And instead, we came up with a way to get 200 parking spaces, 400 parking spaces out of a um, surface parking. We have a hill between the G building and the Advanced Applied Technology Building. And so the um, designers were very innovative in saying what we could do is we can kind of carve out that hill and make tiered parking. It's almost like living in the mountain. <laughs> and that's how they do it in some places. And so we said we could do that and we could save a significant amount of money uh, as opposed to building a parking deck by the way, the parking deck spaces would, came out to be about $25,000 per parking space. When we could do the surface parking for about $5,000 per parking space, so that was a huge savings. In addition to that, the parking lot, I'll say behind the G building, existing parking lot, we said, well, we can reconfigure that parking lot and get some additional spaces. Third floor of the Biotech Center of Excellence building. We 
decided that what we would do, and I don't like this word, but I'll use it. This is what architects use and builders use. We'll, the third floor would be shelf space. We're making that shelf space, we could save a lot more money and stay within budget. Now note that as we make these reductions, the what we'd originally planned just is not there anymore. We have remnants of that in terms of the building. Then the building called for two elevators. Reduction. We took out one of the elevators. The elevator shaft is there for the second elevator. Sometime in the future, when we find other sources of funding, we will add the second elevator. But for now, the way we're designing this building, you'll walk by, you won't even see it. It won't be noticeable to the public that there's a big hollow space there. And that would be an easy uh, retrofit at some later date. Multiple building finishes. We planned the building with nice finishes. Well, we've cut that out as well. And so uh, let me use the flooring as an example. The flooring now will, instead of being some fancy flooring, things that I can't even pronounce, it will be concrete. It would be polished concrete, and I can pronounce that, and I know what it is. And it, the maintenance on it will probably be a little less, too, because it's polished concrete. Now, here's what's left. And I don't want to say that we could cut what's left, because if we do, we're going to definitely have an inferior building, and a building that with, uh, with which the functionality would not be in our best interest and that a building where in we may build it cheaper now but it would cost us more in the long run in terms of maintenance and retrofitting that we surely would have to do. I've been a part of many many buildings I said many many well quite a few buildings during my uh, long career in education and rarely do we get the HVAC system right it's, it's almost a given that you'll come in later because we try to save money. And we'll have to come in later and retrofit the air HVAC system to get it to where it really functions. But we can open the building up. And on certain days of the year, it'd be very comfortable. But on too many days of the year, it's not bearable. So we, uh, the building calls for a chilled beam HVAC system we could do some more reduction there and save about $50,000, but here's the deal. We have laboratories in that space, some high-tech laboratories, and they will be dealing with various substances that do not need to escape and make their way throughout the building. So if we cut that, we could have a problem there. Moreover, it will cost us more to heat and cool that building than it would with a chilled beam HVAC system. Fixed laboratory equipment and casework, we could reduce that and save $387,000. If we do, then we won't have places for the cabinetry and, and, and the um, things that we need to affix to walls that would be uh, in place to support our laboratories, et cetera. Acoustical, pan acoustical panels in common places. Trust me, I've been there too. And I've, during my experience, we've actually reduced budgets by reducing or eliminating the acoustical panels. And then what we had to do is we had to add them back. And when we retrofit after the fact like that, and the price goes up in the meantime, it costs us even more. Multiple building finishes, window treatments, we have to have them. We have a lot of windows in that building. And without the treatments, it could be really, really tough to um, conduct teaching and learning. Signage, we could cut that at this point, but then people would be, certainly be lost a, uh, a lot. Um, hall feature panels. Not really sure what hall featured panels are, but I do know there are certain panels that we need in that building 
to uh, make it fully functional. Multi-line stair rails, carpet reduction, it would reduce the carpet for the most part, and the uh, stair cladding we have, we had white oak, which is very durable. We could reduce that to um, just a stair cladding that um, would not be as durable, and at some point it would have to be replaced. All said and done, we're short $1.9 million, $1,900,430 for the building. So the proposal for, to you tonight for that one is to provide us the funding we need so that we can complete this building. We are set to begin construction next month. It's been a long time coming, and I've said to Tom, I'll believe it when I see it, but we are actually in a position. What we need to start that building, the con actual construction next month, is your approval of an amended budget so that we can do so. Then, of course, we will need to have an emergency uh, meeting of the Board of Trustees. And why an emergency meeting? An emergency meeting is because we have a guaranteed maximum price on steel. Steel is the huge driver in this building. If we lose the guaranteed maximum price on steel, we have until August 27th to get that finalized and done. So if you will approve this tonight, then I will ask the board chair to have an emergency meeting of the board this week so that we can get everything in place and do our state process piece so that we don't lose those prices. If we lose those prices, and this is where I think Matt Brownell can be very helpful. If we, if we lose that opportunity, we're going to pay more. Matt, would you please step forward here and, sure. and explain why we would pay more and maybe talk just a little bit about the escalation here as it's been impacted by COVID-19 and then I will go back to, to the rest of this. Okay. Well, I think it got mentioned earlier, everybody's aware, I think, uh, what's gone on, not just in, in our state, but around the country with significant escalation in the construction industry, labor and materials, and that's impacted multiple projects. Um, you know, just some anecdotal evidence, we're 20% year over year in escalation this year versus last year, and we're only a little over halfway through the year. Just last month, it went up 3% in one month, which is usually what we have for a whole year. So we've got six or seven years of cost escalation built into just two thirds of the way through the year. So it's really unprecedented. And that's, that's why this project and many others are in the position they're in. So that's some just sort of anecdotal numbers. Um, as you mentioned, steel, one of the biggest cost drivers, not just in terms of money on the impact of this project, but also lead time and getting product. And that's part of the desire to lock things in as soon as we can. Um, you know, the, the timing on the job, and Dr. Gatewood mentioned all the efforts we went through with estimating and, and third-party uh, estimators to check it at each stage in design. And unfortunately, just the timing of this job, when we bid it out in April, it, those numbers were no longer relevant because of all those escalations that we've experienced. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any specific questions, but I hope that sort of sums it up. <laughs> I just have a quick question. Yeah. Months ago when we were doing the budget hearings and everything, um, ABSS came before us and said that they were going to have $2.5 million extra dollars in expenses for steel. Is, um, that was months ago when they knew. Are you just finding this out about your steel or is it the same steel? It, it's essentially the same thing. This is a process we've been working through since mm -hmm. we got the bids in April. Okay. And one other thing. Yeah. Um, the HVAC. ABSS, because you're both education, ABSS has got a long list of their HVAC prices for their COVID money, right, Mr. Haygood, help me. Is, does it have to be an old HVAC to updo the HVAC to pay for the HVAC, or can it not be part of their COVID money if they have, I don't know what your COVID money is. Everybody has like a pot of gold around here. I'm just curious, is that something that their COVID money could alleviate that price on that HVAC because I'm sitting here hearing Dr. Gatewood tell me everything that he could change and when you planned your building you planned it right and uh, if you start changing it then something will be the same building you plan to build so 
How would that I, be? I think I'd have to defer to Dr. Gatewood or Tom yeah. perhaps to speak to Tom. their uh, COVID funding and how it might apply to any of these projects. Sure. And while you're walking up there, just one more thing about your furnishings because y'all were doing fundraisers for your pretty chairs and stuff. How's that going? It's going good. Okay. It's going good. And, and that was one of the, that was going to be the next. I'll one. take it back. Go ahead. Now, that's an excellent question about the COVID funds. Um, we can use those on our old existing okay. units, but we can't use it on new construction. We did okay. look into that and, and it wasn't an option. They sure us. are picky about what you can spend they are. on. <laughs> okay. Just asking because it, uh, we saw the list of ABSS and it was this long when it comes to HVAC, so I was just trying to be and sneaky we, and get that in. And we have used it on our existing buildings and we've been able to retrofit some things and improve some airflow, but it's, it's okay. the old stuff. That's cool. Yeah, I said I was going to speak to it. What was it? Furnishings. Oh, I'm sorry. Furnishings. See, if I don't write this down, Dr. Gaywood, it's gone. So I was telling you, that's where I'm I was at. over there because I couldn't get here to write it down. <laughs> but here, here's the, and this is another cost saving. Early on, we said, okay, we need the building. Taxpayers have afforded us X amount of dollars, $17.6 million for this project. We will get out and we will fundraise for the tables and chairs, the furniture fixing and equipment. Now when I, I'm talking about the equipment that is movable, that supports teaching and learning, not that that is affixed to the walls or to the building. And so that was estimated to be $5 million. And we are making really good progress on that. We are, essentially uh, we've raised a couple million dollars and we will raise the remainder of this money so that's five million dollars that's not a burden to taxpayers so now what I would like to do is, is just talk for a few minutes about the student services building the student services building is over budget by five hundred and three thousand five hundred dollars what did what have we done to date to bring that price within the budget we started right from the front from the beginning again i i was insistent that we would build that building at a price that would not exceed the budget we started out at a 27,400 square feet building well, guess what it is now? It's 12,203 square feet. And that was really a $4 million reduction. We decre de decreased the steel tonnage in the flooring by over 50%. Now, this is one that I had to really wrestle with. The steel tonnage kind of shores up the building and makes it safe. We're still within the safe zone but we need to control the speed at which people walk within that building. If you walk more than so many feet per second, then you may feel a little vibration. But it meets code, so we're just meeting code. If we were to reduce it any more, we wouldn't meet code. So we got the steel tonnage down to where it meets code, but we'll strategically place furnishings, et cetera, in a way where we won't have people moving too fast in the building. You've been in a place, you, I mean, you've all had children perhaps, and when they're young, they like to just go fast. And, and some adults do that too, even today, and so we gotta tone them down to where they walk at a, a reasonable pace so we don't get that vibration. Because if you get the vibration, it will feel unsafe. It will be safe, the building the floor is not gonna fall in, but it's, it will be a little shaky. We um, automatic classroom meeting room folding petitions. We reduced that to manual. We had it planned to where they would be electronic, electric, where you push a button and these room dividers move back and forth. Well, now we're going to keep our arms exercised and legs. We, we, we'll do it manually so we can cut that out. 
uh, and then multiple uh, multiple building finishes we removed or replaced with lesser quality uh, and that saved us about sixty thousand dollars all in all that's about four million five hundred thousand or so don't hold me to that exact number because I'm adding here as I look so where are we today? Five hundred, three thousand, five hundred over budget. What is left? And maybe I can make a case as to why we shouldn't cut those. But I do have the folding partitions in classroom. I don't mean the ones that are manual. I mean just having a partition, they would be manual. But that's fifty-one thousand five hundred dollars. Building generator. And I asked my staff, I said, why do we need the generator? It's data and those kind of things. We, we can't afford to lose it. Uh, ADA parking in the rear of the building, we could eliminate that, $13,000. I don't want to do it. I'm getting older. I mean, want to park there one day. <laughs> emergency exit stairway. Here's the deal about the stairway, the emergency exit stairway. We don't have to have it. We got feedback from the occupants to be the, the faculty and staff who would be in that building. And they brought to our attention, if we have a fire or if we have uh, an active shooter, then what do we do? We can't escape this building. And we'll be in good shape as long as those things never happen. <laughs> if they do, it's on, it's on our watch, so to speak. But that's um, $145,000. Simplex fire alarm controls, and I, this is not a lot of money, but I said, why do we have to have Simplex? It's consistent with all the others we have to have. It's a reduction on training, and it just makes sense, $30,000, but we could reduce that by 30000 And again, the building finishes, $78,500. Um, could have ground face masonry versus split. We want the building to be a little bit attractive. We want it to be a lot attractive, but you know, beauty costs. Um, and then the, um, that would also include stainless steel handrails, which I think we really should do that. If we get the kind that are not stainless steel, we will constantly be painting them. And it's amazing how, when you're in a high traffic area with students, you need to paint a lot. And that could be a real, real a problem. Mm -hmm. And the, um, so those are some of the things that we've done to keep this, these buildings within the budget that were originally planned for them. Um, don't know what else to say except we are, uh, this is time sensitive. We really need to move now, it, can, it will cost us more if we can't get this done. No pressure. I, I don't like this. I don't even like for things to appear to have be pressure like that, but it is where we are. Ms. Evans, or one of you two ladies, will this cause us to spend more money than the taxpayers approved? So the taxpayers re referendum for a $39.6 million uh, bond referendum would allow us to issue, issue that amount in debt. Due to a premium bond market, we can get more cash than that on occasion. There's no guarantee that we would in the next issuance, but we did in April. So it's possible that the $39.6 million approved by the bo uh, bond referendum could be expanded past that dollar amount to pay for these projects. It would not cost any additional tax dollars. The capital plan already incorporates funding for this at this time. How? If you decide on a certain amount and then it's going to be more than that, how does that not cost more? The tax dollars that are in the plan mm -hmm. were originally anticipating higher interest rates than our bond referendum, our issuance actually cost us so we've saved a little bit of money with the bond premium we saved a little bit of money with the interest rates and there's still money available to them right now it's being held in cap in 
capital reserves instead of being needed to pay the, the bond debt. And this isn't the only thing you're building or spending. No, no. Because like if you get this additional and then come back and everything goes even crazier, just what do we do? Because we made a promise for the bond for the, but the county voted for it and we made a promise to uphold that without taking one thing away from education. I mean, this is, a, this is I, mean, I know, because everything just, I mean, plywood, name it, it's just everything. I don't understand how this works, but it does with shipping and stuff. But I'm just curious, is that going to affect that if later something else happens and it pushes this way up? Because you can't make plans to build buildings like this and then have to, you, you don't go from like the Hilton to an apartment. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you just don't do that because that isn't what people had in mind to pay for to start with. They wanted this done right, you know, because you don't want to come back two or three years and take all them handrails, <laughs> put them up like they do it because everybody's got splinters in their hands. I mean, that sounds silly, but I mean, you can't, you can't do it half, halfway. I'll watch what I say. I almost said it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Help me. Because, I mean, I don't have a construction company, obviously, but this, this is not going to be the only time this is going to happen because this is key, it's never going away, it seems like. And what do we do? Let me attempt to respond to that. I Good can't luck. necessarily talk dollars and cents like Andrea can. But I can say this. When we were designing these two buildings, we were designing them during a time when the volatility, market volatility, was nothing like it is now. Market in terms of building supplies, etc. We didn't have have a COVID-19 um, virus upon us, driving prices like we've never seen before. But we do now, so we are in the design stage of the public safety training center right now. But we know this is in place, so we're going to design a very different public safety training center building. And I have already said that it, it, you've seen these churches that are built relatively inexpensively, but they look really good. And you walk in and they're very functional. They work very well. And so I'm thinking, I'm not an architect by any means, but I'm saying that we need to build something. We need to be very innovative in how we build this next building, the center. Now, there's some things I don't care how innovative we are. Concrete is concrete. I don't know how you change that. There's some things like that. But when it comes down to the building itself, we can be incredibly innovative. So I think we'll be able to do it. It's going to be hard. It's going to be tight. But we know it going into the process. I think y'all should ask something. Mr. Lashley, any questions? Uh, yeah, I got a lot of questions. Just trying to figure out where, where I want to start. Uh, have your AC Board of Trustees had a chance to look at your um, differences than you started out with? Did they have a chance to look at what you yes. presented tonight? And yes. they're, they're good with it? Yes. They under, they, we made it very clear in our last board meeting that we would be coming here okay. for this purpose. I'll let you guys go. I'm going to get my stuff together. Dr. Gatewood, as I understand it, the, the request tonight is that the, that the county front ACC the $2.4 million uh, and would be reimbursed for that uh, with the next bond issuance. Is that accurate? Is that what your ask is? Uh, the re my request is that the county um, approves the additional $2.4 million. Now, how the county does that is 
left up to you all. I mean, it seems to me that there are a couple ways. One is through the uh, capital reserve. The other is through benefiting from the um, available bond capacity. Well, maybe ask a better question for Mr. Hagan. As I understand mm -hmm. the resolution that was presented in the packet, it, it's it, did I state it correctly? Yes, there's a so you have a capital project ordinance in your packet that sets uh, the budget for the Center of Excellence and the Student Services Center at the dollar amounts that the college is saying are the new dollar amounts to, to build those two projects. Um, you also have a resolution that Susan will be presenting in a moment, it's a reimbursement resolution, that the commissioners would use if you want to uh, pay those additional uh, funds from the debt issuance that's coming in September of 22. That reimbursement resolution would allow you to pay back the capital reserve fund. So you could you could either use capital reserves to to increase this budget or uh, the reimbursement resolution to use proceeds from the debt issuance in September. So there been, there are there are two bond issuances for ACC. One was April 2021, correct? That's correct. And the second is September of 2022. Yes, right. About uh, is that is it what 20 million 20.6 million issued in April? So April of 21, the bond par that was issued uh, was twenty million six hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars, and the and the September 22 amount would be about fifteen point eight. That is the remaining bond projects uh, total. Mm -hmm. All right, and as I understand it, there's the voters approved thirty nine point six million dollars for ACC's six projects, right? The voters approved the commissioners. To have the ability to issue $39.6 million in bond debt for community college projects. Yes, sir. And the ACC chose six projects, right? Yes. That's that is uh, correct. The Center for Excellence, the Student Service Center, the, the Safety, uh, the Training Center, uh, Classroom Revitalization, ACC East, ACC West. That's correct. And the, the ones that were funded out of April 2021 were the first two the Center of Excellence and the, and the uh, Student Service Center. That's correct. correct. So it leaves the last the last four for are covered by the second bond issuance, right? Yes. Um, Dr. Gatewood, the training center is still in the design phase. Is that right? That's correct. And what phase is um, the classroom modernization in? We have not started the design phase there yet. Okay. That's a the safety the safety center is 10.4 million budgeted the child care classroom modernization is 4.4 .4 budgeted does that sound about right and then 500,000 for ACC East 500,000 for ACC West correct and what are, where do the ACC East and ACC West where do those projects stand ACC West would would um, include uh, classrooms I think about 10,000 square feet is what we said for classrooms uh, and uh, to accommodate medical related classes of course we'd have some general education there as well and ACC East would be uh, the same about 10,000 square feet that would accommodate uh, classes in that are more business or related industrial or uh, or related business administration engineering those type of programs they kind of fit the two areas uh, where these sites would be located. And so, Mr. Hagan, if the if the county were to front this 2.4 million, then the county, would, under this plan that was proposed, would be reimbursed at the September in a year, essentially a year yes. from now. It would, re it would reimburse the capital fund for ACC. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. We'd point out. Section number six does talk about the reimbursement in the place ordinance. So that's included in the uh, in the ordinance itself. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. In, in section six, it doesn't differentiate between whether that is bond proceeds for like the original uh, dollar amounts for the bond projects or any uh, use of premium. So that's the option if the board chooses to do that is up to the board. So it's not you're not nailed down tonight to determine what bond proceeds you would use you're just saying if you approve the project ordinance as it is written you're increasing the budgets for the center of excellence and the student services center 
and you're saying you will pay yourself back per this project ordinance with proceeds from debt issued and it would be issued in September of um, 22. And what would be issued in September 22 is the 15.8 million and the, the option that the county could take or not take to issue the approximately three point or three uh, three point one million dollars ish in what we've taught what we've termed as premium uh, from the last bond issue which that's an option that's that correct okay? yes all right how did you determine um, just look, talking to your staff how did you determine the bond premium on a bond that hasn't been issued yet so different people talk about it in different ways mm -hmm. Staff level, we talk about it as unissued bond par. Gotcha. Well, you, you, you can get close. And it's resulting from the previous bond premium. So, so we're guesstimating that number. The unissued bond par is not a guess. We know the exact amount. Um, and we, we don't, don't know, know what the if cost. at the next issuance if there might be additional premium. All right. Okay. okay. Are you likely to have to cut out some of the other projects in the future? Mr. Chairman, East and West, we're certainly going to have to have partners. And while I'm not privy to mention the partner in the West today, but we have a, a, a prospective partner that would perhaps, please, perhaps, maybe, maybe not, invest significantly more than the 500000 we just simply use the 500000 as part of the leverage to get a deal. It may take a while. But if you don't meet your budget, you just cut something out. We would have to. Yes, sir. Mr. Carter, any questions? Well, as, as you all know, I've been, sitting, I've been going through this with uh, Dr. Gatewood as a member, of, as a brand new, met, newly minted member of the ACC board. And I can tell you, um, from the perspective of the Building and Grounds Committee and from the perspective of Peter, the Dr. Gatewood and his team, that they have been pulling their hair out trying to figure out exactly what to do. I see Al be there checking to make sure he's still got some left. <laughs> but um, uh, it's, uh, we all, we, we've, we're seeing this everywhere in construction. I mean, the county's looking at it with our own projects. And, Schools are looking at it with their projects, and uh, the, the, the private market's looking at it, and all the projects they're dealing with in the county. Everything's going up, so it's uh, uh, it's been a real struggle to figure out what to do. And the, uh, the board of the um, building and grounds committee and the board of trustees have all uh, asked Dr. Gatewood to come and uh, make this recommendation and presentation tonight. So. <clears throat> Mr. Rollins, Ms. Evans, Mr. Haygood, what is your recommendation? So just to just to make sure everybody's on the same page, just let me recap where we are with bond bond par. So uh, in November of 2018, um, the voters recommend uh, approve the commissioners be able to issue 39.6 million dollars in uh, bond funds for the college. Then in April, right, of 2021. The county issued a bond par amount for the college of $20,665,000. That left an available unissued bond par of $18,935,000. So the remaining bond projects for the college, you know, all the all the child care safety, uh, child care center, public safety training center, satellite east and west, uh, total per the budgets $15,840,000. That leaves three million and ninety five thousand dollars in available unissued bond par right part of the thirty nine point six million dollars how can that be possible the commissioners authorized the, the county staff to take premium only in the amount that was needed to get the project funds to the to the dollar amount to do the center for excellence and the student service center plus issuance cost um, so the premium that we took april 21 was three million one hundred and sixty nine thousand seven hundred and fifty four dollars so right now uh, the, the commissioners could approve the college to go forward with these increased budgets uh, for the Center of Excellence and the Student Services Center and be able to in September of 22 re repay the capital reserve account with either this unissued par debt or 
uh, proceeds that because you, you draw down or you reduce the dollar amounts for the other projects. That's another option also. So I think the fact that we have a reimbursement resolution here before you tonight, that keeps that door open so you are able to reimburse yourself. Uh, you know, our hope will be that the rest of the projects come in uh, either on their budget or if the college knows on the front end that they can, they're going to have to look at the design process knowing that COVID has drove those prices up, you know, the hope will be that we, we can get all six projects done for the college for the $39.6 million in bond par. You may have to use premium, the premium to do that. You're issuing $39.6 million as authorized by the voters, but getting more for your money and our plan will pay for that. So, um, so did I cover that succinctly? But this premium isn't imaginary money. We have to pay it back. Yes. Because yeah. I know Alamance County committed to $39.6 million for the ACC. And I think that's what we need to stay committed to. I, know, I, I mean, I know everybody is, whatever you planned last year before last, is, is totally out of whack now. It, um, it's important to know that the capital project ordinance, the document that you uh, has been presented, is a way to increase the budget for these two projects. It suggests using bond par, but it does not require that. That means that the board, at a later date, can determine if you want to use another funding source. You have the option of using the capital reserve, or you have the option of communicating that the other bond project should be reduced in order to make this work. And you may make that decision as we get further along in the design process and uh, cost estimates from the college. Uh, the decision about how much to issue in September would have to be made, obviously, before September. Um, but you, you might reduce project uh, funding at that time. That's September of 2023. To 22. 22. Yes, Thank you. Board, any further questions? Do we have a motion? I'll make the motion that we approve the ordinance, including all the elements as presented to us uh, in 8.5 print A, including section six for the reimbursement. I'll second that. I was on mute again and I didn't get a chance to make the motion, but thank you. Mr. Paisley. This is one thing I don't know what to do. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I'm sorry, is it open for discussion? Yeah. Yes. I, I would I would be inclined to support that motion <coughs> with, the, with the following proviso. Um, that the voters have approved $39.6 million for six projects. Um, the other four projects, other than these two, are in the either in the planning phase or still in the idea phase. That would be correct. Um, Though the resolution allows uh, issuance of $3 million in, in bond premium, it does not require that. And I, at this point, would not be inclined to vote for that. Um, I would be inclined to front ACC the money to take care of these projects. I believe in these projects. I believe in the biotech, bio, the, the biotech center and, its, and its, uh, its mission and the student service center. And if, if ACC believes that these are required to f fully fulfill that mission, then, then I would be inclined to support that and would vote for that. But I think ACC in its planning of the other four projects needs to take into account the, the additions here and make appropriate uh, adjustments to the other four projects to stay within the $39.6 million that the voters have approved. And on that proviso, I'd be inclined to support this. I would uh, like to amend my motion to include that provision. Mr. Carter? Would you approve that as a second? I would. Any further discussion? As amended, all in favor of the uh, motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? No. no I'm, I don't know what to do. Well, I'm just confused. I, I'm, I'm so confused, and because I, I, like. I don't, I think if you're going to, 
build it. You, you can't, before you even dig the dirt up, you can't start taking away from it. I mean, it's, it's got to go with what the whole mission of it's for. Um, May I make a comment? Yes. Ms. Thompson, I think one of the issues that you, you're concerned about and, uh, um, has been the impact on the, on the county on the budget. The issue is that the interest rates are significantly lower now than they were when we budgeted for the bonds in the first place or planned for the bonds and planned the repayment schedule. Thus, the debt service cost, the interest cost, is lower. So when you get the premium, it's factored in. We can make the same payment with a higher debt level and a lower interest rate, just like you would if you got a mortgage on a house. One of the reasons mortgage uh, how homes are selling so rapidly right now and at higher dollar levels are that or is that the buyer can get is getting a lower interest rate. Rates are in the one percent range instead of four, five, six, seven, eight percent. So they can buy more house with less money in interest debt or interest cost. And that's what we're dealing with in the bond. I just want to say 39.6 is what every voter agreed to, mm -hmm. and I'm going to respect that. Me too. And so no matter how it goes, that's going to be the limit. That's, that's it. I, I will not go against what people have put their name on when it comes to that, because I think what they voted for was extremely generous, because a bond is not an imaginary bunch of money. It's also taxes, you know? It's like saying a grant is free money. No, it's not. Nothing is free. And I just, I want this to be built right because it, it deserves to be. There's been a lot of hard work on this. But I also am, I'm going to honor what the taxpayer voted because that's what I'm supposed to do. And um, we're just going to pray that steel just becomes 50 cent a hundred foot. I don't know. <laughs> like that's going to happen. I, I believe it will. I mean, Let me state this. Oh Questions on the floor. So having debate in the middle of a vote is unusual, sorry, John. But, but having said that, I totally agree with the two of you that I will not vote to go beyond that $39 million. Uh, but having said that, we're required to vote one way or the other. And Mr. Mr. Carter and I voted okay. yes. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Ashley voted no. Uh, Steve's trying to get your attention. Yes. Mr. 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 Chairman. Yes. I think that's where we are. Did I understand the motion correctly? We're talking about trying to keep the bond within $39.6 million? That's my understanding. So that's where we are in this motion. Now, we have to have a vote from Ms. Thompson and Mr. Turner. Uh, actually, I'd like you to, um, just for my own, just for the public, can you just tell us what the motion is again? The motion is exactly what the ordinance is. Right on 8.5A, mm -hmm. which does include reimbursement, right. but it's modified by Mr. Turner's motion uh, or amended, uh, and repeat your amendment, please. That, that we would not, with the two bond issuances, April 21, September 22, we would not go above the $39.6 million authorized by the votes. Right, and that's my understanding as well. Okay. So we're, we're okay. agreeing to stay within okay. the 39 We're kind of like spotting them that. some money. Give them a little bit. Correct. Just kind of, okay, okay, okay. All right, let's, let's... I'm sorry. I'm not sure how we're voting. <laughs> well, <laughs> the we're question great. is on the floor. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I did. I said aye. I didn't right. Everyone, <laughs> so it's a 5-0 vote. Yeah. Oh Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. And thank you for your amendment. I wasn't going to hey, Miss Evans. I didn't understand. I didn't mean to say that. I'm sure you're going to follow that, right? That's it. Can you say when I reduce that? That's right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. This is going to be about money. Good evening, commissioners. Um, in light of the motion that you just approved, um, the next order for us to do would be to adopt a res reimbursement resolution 
Um, this would cover the 18.9 of unissued bond proceeds. This will help benefit ACC as they are moving forward with the Public Safety Training Center, as well as the instructional space and child care facilities and the Campus West and East. Um, this will allow us to go ahead and pay for some upfront cost, which are architectural designs, um, same process that we had for the Center of Excellence and the Student Services Center. Um, but this would go ahead and give us that authority to move forward with those projects. So this is for the 18935000 to be issued in the fall of 2022? Yes, sir. Because they're not done right now. They're not even on paper, right. sort of, kind of. Okay. We have not issued those bonds. What this will allow the county to do is to go ahead and pay for cost up front, so architectural cost, site development, those initial costs, any early construction costs that we should have, say, prior to the um, bonds being sold, we do not anticipate that those initial costs would reach anywhere near the $18.9 million. Okay. Um, but this gives us the authority to start that reimbursement process. <clears throat> Any motion questions? To, uh, motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Carter, any further discussion? I'm good. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Haygood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, Commissioners. So I'm going to uh, go over some of our capital projects and just give the Commissioners an update. Uh, there's no action required for this item. This is strictly informational for the Board, but to give you an idea of what's going on and also to let you know what to be expecting um, from county staff in the next couple of months. So uh, the Commissioners approved uh, the county's capital plan is part of our budget process for fiscal year 21-22. That plan identifies our capital projects, the timelines, the funding sources, uh, as we know about these projects. And also, the uh, capital plan has a section for communications technology. Uh, most of that is for our 911 center. Uh, so we're going to, uh, it also contains an update on capital projects underway and upcoming. So I want to start off, and these are, these are the We'll go through a list of the primary projects in our capital plan and give you an update. Uh, we have the Ann Petrie Ivy Building, which is located over behind the Human Services Center. Uh, that uh, project was budgeted at a little over $2.8 million, funding coming from Mr. Ron Petrie, generous donation. The occupants of this uh, facility will include Friendship Adult Day Service, the Open Door Clinic, and a division of Alamance County um, Department of Social Services. Uh, this is about a 12,000 square foot building constructed directly behind the Human Services Center uh, near Rudd Street. And uh, right now the project's on time. It's scheduled to be completed in October. We're very excited about it. If you haven't had a chance to drive by on Rudd Street, it really looks nice. First class building. We're very grateful to Mr. Petrie. We'll be letting the commissioners know when we do a ribbon cutting and hopefully Mr. Petrie will be able to come and join us for that. So all the tenants are very excited too. So that project is going very well. Touch on the Mental Health Diversion Center. Uh, so, you know, currently the county uh, contracts with RHA and RHA as part of our contracted services leases a facility on Anne Elizabeth Drive in Burlington over near Holly Hill Mall. That's where our diversion and crisis uh, pro, uh, services are provided by RHA. We do have funding in hand uh, to do, uh, to work on a building uh, for uh, diversion services to be provided. We have a project budget in our hands of a little over one and a half million dollars. That, that $1.5 million came from Cardinal Innovations several, about two years ago, I believe. They gave the county a grant, one-time grant of $1.2 million to be used specifically for Diversion Center Capital. And then we also have uh, maintenance of effort money. We have money every year that we're required to spend on mental health services. We've been required to do that since, I believe, 2007. We've had some that is unspent, and we have added it to this pot. So we have uh, the 1562 uh, in funding available for this. Originally, the county was looking at putting this facility in the Elderly Services Building on Martin Street over beside the Family Justice Center, uh, and it would be for RHA and for several other mental health providers. The idea was to make it like a one-stop shop for mental health crisis and diversion services like the Family Justice Center. But as we got into planning, commissioners know this, uh, we determined that the Elderly Services Building is not large enough. We are looking at other properties, other facilities. 
uh, for this. And uh, we would certainly be able to use our 1.5 million. We're working with VIA, our new LME MCO. They are very aggressive and have been very excited knowing that this is a priority for Alamance County. So they've been extremely helpful already, just as they've gotten their feet on the ground here. Uh, and we, we would also look at would uh, ARP funding possibly be eligible for this or pandemic funding? You know, we talked last time in the manager's report, I'm going to give you an update about the possibility of reimbursing ourselves with ARP dollars. The commissioners have some options of what to do with that once we, uh, if we decide to reimburse ourselves, which we uh, voted to do. So we're closing in on Mental Health Diversion Center. Glad to have VIA on board uh, with that project. Update about the dental clinic. We have the dental clinic for uh, pediatric dentistry over on McKinney Street, right beside the Human Services Center and the building there beside the gas station on McKinney. Uh, the, the, they need to do facility updates to that property, HVAC, parking lot improvements. They have a stormwater problem on that uh, parking lot and some interior renovations for social distancing. The project budget is $140,000. We do not have a budget yet for the interior. They're working on that budget. But the dental clinic is self-supported. That doesn't receive any tax dollars. It's paid through uh, fees and Medicaid uh, funding that it receives to provide these services. So they have designated funds. They're planning to use their designated funds to make these renovations. So these are not uh, county general fund dollars. We are working to obtain an easement uh, from a private property that we would need to cross to do the stormwater work. Once we get that, we'll be able to bid this project out and have it dialed in a little bit closer. But exciting project for the dental clinic. Um, Medicap, update on Medicap. As the commissioners recall, we've talked about Medicap recently. Uh, the county currently has three suites at uh, the Medicap facility, A, B, and C. We currently lease all three of these. The A suite, which was the primary pharmacy piece of the building, we leased originally for the tax department to use for COVID because of the drive through. The, suite, the A suite lease is scheduled to expire the end of this month. Uh, we extended it for one month uh, after the, the July expiration. The B and C suites uh, are currently used for the Board of Elections to store uh, voting equipment and they also use it for balloting and for canvassing and some training. The B and C leases expire October 31st. We had considered the Medicap building for uh, purchase uh, by the county and renovation to try to look at moving the entire Board of Elections operations into Medicap. We had estimated that project at $1.7 million and was going to be paid for with a combination of capital reserves and debt. But we were informed very, very recently that the owner uh, has the building under contract. It is being sold and we've been told the county must vacate all the suites at the end of the current leases. So we will be working closely with the Board of Elections to remove all of their um, items in the B and C suites. That will be a task. I know uh, spoke with Kathy Holland today and uh, you know so they're gearing up for the municipal elections and we're going to be working with her. I think Sherry's already started discussions with her about where to take this this equipment that is in the B and C uh, leases. That was not expected. That's news mm -hmm. to us. So we'll be working uh, uh, with Kathy and her. Excuse group. me Mr. Haygood. Um, um, you said we have to uh, does the lease expires that we're dealing with now is 1031. Yes. Sir. That's right in the middle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, it, uh, we inquired about the possibility. To stay away from that. Yes. Yeah. It, uh, uh, we're, we're not going to have an opportunity to extend the lease for BNC, so we will have to get the equipment out of there. So we're going to be uh, working diligently through the municipal election process itself to try to find space for the equipment that uh, the Board of Elections has in that property. So not much left in the A suite. I think Board of Elections has a little bit of stuff in there, but tax has been back in the county office building for quite some time. So, uh, so we do have an HVAC project at the Human Service Center. Human Service Center is Old County Hospital over on Graham Hopedale Road, houses uh, uh, DSS and our health department. Uh, we're looking to upgrade the existing HVAC system there and the controls. Buddy's been working very hard uh, to get that project uh, off the ground. We do have a low bid in by Superior Mechanical at almost one and a half million dollars, which was about what we estimated. We were pretty pretty close on our estimates. Uh, we In our capital plan, we have the capacity to fund this project from an installment loan. We're going to uh, be working to finalize the bids and bring a debt issuance request uh, next month to the, to the commissioners to consider. We had originally in our capital plan planned to time the Medicap debt and this debt at the same time to try to to put those two together, obviously the Medicap piece is out. 
But we will also be looking at this project with an ARP eye to see what of this uh, $1,489,000 might be ARP eligible. We understand that's a commissioner decision. It's not a, it's not a given or a lock. But if we can determine what we think uh, in ARP dollars it might be eligible, we will let you know that when we come back in September. This is a, a much needed project. Uh, I think Buddy, uh, I think Buddy's here. He's masked. I can see him back there. He can attest to uh, uh, the need for this project in the Human Service Center. So. And an update on the court administration building and the J.B. Allen Courthouse renovation. Commissioners will recall in our capital plan, we uh, have uh, capacity and a plan to construct a new court administrative building and to renovate J.B. Allen to uh, move all administrative offices into the new construction and turn J.B. Allen into multiple courtrooms instead of offices and courtrooms. The total project budget in our capital plan is about $13.6 million. The intent would be to fund that project with debt proceeds. We do have the capacity for that in our plan to pay the debt service uh, based on our estimates. If we proceed with this project, the construction of the court administration building is scheduled per the plan to begin in March of 22. I, I just don't know that that's possible, but that is per the plan. Uh, and then the renovations are scheduled per the capital plan in J.B. Allen to begin in June of 2023. So we have uh, gone ahead and put out a request for qualifications to try to find a design firm to lead both of those projects. We got back 14 RFQs uh, from firms that are interested in, in doing this work, doing the design service work. Uh, we have a group that we will be looking at to help us review these RFQs. We'll be involved in uh, county manager's office. I think. Uh, uh, Buddy, of course, some of our representatives from court leadership, I think uh, Chairman Paisley mentioned he was interested in looking at those RFQs and we can make those available to any of the commissioners too, but we'll have a score sheet for the folks that are looking at these, collect scores, take those to our purchasing department so they can do the official tabulation. And once we select a firm, uh, we hope to be able to do this before uh, the first meeting in September for the commissioners, we would come back to you and say, okay, we've selected a firm. We would like to proceed with this. Uh, we think it's possible that our funding could be used for the planning and, uh, and possibly some of the construction. We don't know that. It's renovations in J.B. Allen, so if we're doing HVAC renovations over there or any kind of social distancing. I think we would, we would look at the possibility of the planning costs for this project. If we are looking at how to make courts more socially distanced and more safe, we may be able to offset some of those costs with our funding too. Hey, Mr. Are, Good, let me interrupt there. Yes, sir. Uh, for all of the commissioners, Mr. Carter included, Miss um, Hook has a packet for each one of the 14 uh, bidders. So uh, I would encourage you to go by, pick those up, and look at them, and vote. Yes, we, uh, if the commissioners are interested in receiving that, we can, we can provide those to you, a copy of the responses from each of the 14 groups. So 14 design firms sent back there, they're putting the best foot forward, saying why you should pick our firm. We did not get into prices. This is strictly based on qualifications. You have, for this design service, you have to look at their history, the projects that they've done, and try to pick who you think has got the most experience, the best fit. You know, you bring them in, you interview them, you talk with them, then you start getting into price. If you find you can't afford that company, you have to move to the second most qualified in the score. Period. Is there any, like anybody from Alamance County? I think we did have like some Atlee, from Alamance Carmen County. And King, I can't remember off the top of my I head. I can't remember off the top of my okay. head. I think, I think we, we did, or we at least had representatives from Alamance County. One or two were in firms that had been bought, I believe, if okay. I remember right. So. I hope we really think about that. Alamance County. Mm -hmm. And you know, it'll be really important to find a firm that is capable of working with, uh, you know, I think the, the sheriff is going to be involved in this project from a court security pers uh, perspective. You have uh, superior court, district court judges, the district attorney, the clerk of court. There are a number of uh, mm -hmm. elected officials as well as staff. So we, we're, we'll be looking for a firm that has that kind of experience, right? That maybe has done a courthouse somewhere else because you know anytime you're building a new courthouse or doing renovations you're dealing with uh, the court inner operations and it's it's uh, uh, good to have some group that has that kind of experience well, this is the final slide uh, just to bring the commissioners up to speed on the Mebane area EMS base we talked about uh, our capital plan has the capability of uh, funding this project also Mebane is our fastest growing uh, call center, center of calls. When you look at a heat map of Alamance County EMS calls, 
you'll see that uh, Mevin is uh, blooming and uh, doesn't have an EMS base in the city or, or, or immediately adjacent to the city. Uh, this project includes uh, the acquisition of land and the uh, new construction, a multi-bay ambulance base and an EMS garage, and the total project cost is estimated at a little over three and a half million dollars. Funding for this project per our capital plan comes from a combination of capital reserves, so there's some cash, some debt, and we are talking with property owners and we'll be back to the commissioners at the second meeting in uh, September to talk to you about a land acquisition possibility. So um, just setting the table for what you can expect from these different capital projects. I think that's the end of my, my presentation, Mr. Chairman. I don't, there's no action for this item, strictly an update, and to give the commissioners an opportunity to ask any questions if you have. On our next meeting uh, is September, what's the date? Seven. 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 Um, yeah, we're going to be a real bind with the Board of Elections. Yes. Um, so I would encourage staff to come back with recommendations. I think we'll be, uh, we'll, we'll really need to get with the Board of Elections staff, go over to Medicap, make sure we fully understand as staff what <clears throat> type of equipment they have, what equipment requires the level of security that some of their equipment requires. Not all of their items require the heightened level of security but this this a lot of this equipment is under uh, video surveillance and pretty uh, sophisticated locks and all those kind of things so i think we'll be working over the next couple of days try to ascertain how much square footage is needed and what under secured uh eyes and what could uh it, it doesn't require that much security that'll be a little easier i think to find to find uh, alternative space but would indicate to the rest of the board uh, I think the Medicap piece of this puzzle we just found out about what this morning yes sir. yes so uh, this is brand slab new it is I was preparing this uh, that was not on my slide when uh, I prepared it over the weekend so uh, I had to do some quick editing but uh, you know board of election staff is great they do excellent work I know everyone here is familiar with them um, we're certain that we can figure out a way to uh, you know, continue to help them have an efficient and effective election and take care of this equipment too. So. And if we can afford to do so, I was on the Board of Elections for not quite 110 years, well anyway, <laughs> that might be a major exa exaggeration, but for like 16 years or so. Uh, and a lot of that equipment has got to be secure. Yes. Uh, we Temperature cannot. also? Mm -hmm. yeah. Climate control. Sorry. Climate control yeah. also? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So uh, yeah, I would encourage us to move quickly, but carefully, um, and it'd be awfully nice to have everything in one location as, as opposed to scattered throughout the county. We certainly will. And uh, we, we, working with uh, Kathy and her group through this last election, uh, you know, we, we know how important it is to maintain um, a level of integrity for the election process and to be able to demonstrate that, uh, you know, it's, uh, equipment is safeguarded and all of the ballots and all of those things are done properly so um, we'll be working with her in the next couple of days to put it together Amy, thank you thank yes. you thank you thank you Brian. okay uh, miss hook and madam this is your I hope so Good evening. So I am here before the board to ask for consideration of extension of the emergency um, paid sick leave. So as you'll remember, um, last year the Families First Coronavirus Response Act allowed for up to two weeks of paid <coughs> sick leave when an employee wasn't able to work because they were COVID positive or they had been placed in quarantine. Um, so that act ended December 31st, 2020. We came back to the board and asked if you guys would um, enact an Alamance County policy that would extend those provisions. And that um, was, that the board did that and that went through June 30th, 2021. So we thought we were in good shape, um, but now we're seeing that COVID is coming back around and we're having employees that are needing to be out either isolated, quarantined, or, or either positive, quarantined, or isolated. 
Um, so what I'm asking tonight is that the board um, consider reinstating this program, taking it back to July 1st, because I do have some employees who have been sick the last few months between July 1st and now, uh, taking it back to July 1st and then extending it through the end of the year. So basically this would be to protect employees who need to be out and encourage them to be out when they are sick so that they are not bringing it in and getting other employees sick. So um, if you want to, this could be used as an opportunity to encourage employees to get vaccinated by saying that those would be the ones that could be um, eligible for this program. As staff, we just want the sick leave um, sick leave protection enacted. So I will say that the sheriff has made the decision that in his office or his area, he wants to do the, um, uh, the provision of if you don't have the vaccine, you wouldn't be eligible for this. The sheriff can do that in his area and it not be, um, it doesn't have to be what we enact for the rest of the county. Since he's an elected official, his, his uh, area is a little bit different than what we do for the rest of the county. So what I'm asking is um, if you guys would extend the emergency paid sick leave and how you would like to see that program set up. Now they would have to test positive in order to be eligible, is that correct? Right, so it would be the same way that we have um, monitored that in the past. They would have to give us something that says they're positive, that they've been quarantined. So we're gonna ask for all of that documentation and we monitor that in human resources. It would be the same way we've done that for the past year and a half. Are you noticing, and I don't even know if you can answer this, but are, are you noticing like we're seeing on the news um, if anybody that's already been vaccinated is getting COVID? So we have seen some employees that have been vaccinated and have tested COVID positive, have okay. had symptoms and tested COVID positive. Okay. Yes. I'll be honest with you. I think everybody can do what they want to. This my body, my choice cannot be situational. And it seems to be that way. And, um, and I'm not going to go against anybody or support him. I'm just going to speak how I feel personally. I've been vaccinated, but I chose to be vaccinated. Nobody told me to. And I'm not in a situation where I'm around everybody that I could be a risk. But I am everybody walking around in the world. I, I'm a groupie over here at the coffee shop. So I'm just saying I, I personally cannot support anybody telling someone that they have got to have this vaccination or there's going to be some kind of penalty, whatever that penalty looks like. We're seeing where hospital employees and other kind of employees are being told if you don't get a vaccine, you don't have to have a job. And I, you'll never convince me that during a pandemic, you want to lose hospital employees because we are not emergency room technicians and we ain't going to go over there and work. I mean, it, it would not be good. And I, I don't mean to take this lightly because I don't, but um, you know, that, that's part of our freedoms and, and our rights. We hear about rights all the time where all kind of stuff doesn't make it right, but we have rights. And, um, I, and I understand with the sheriff because he's got a closed in building there on top of each other. But me personally, I, I cannot put my stamp on something where I'm going to tell you, if you don't get the vaccine, there's some things you're not going to get and when it comes to financially. And I, 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 that's just me. I'm one of five. And that's, I just need to get that out there because um, I see where hospital workers are on the front cover of Time magazine. They're the hero of the month. They're getting welcome parades. And now, what happened to that, you know? And they're still saving lives. They saved lives then. Some even lost their life. And many of them worked without a vaccine because at that time there wasn't a vaccine. And they still showed up just like EMS, fire and police did here in Alamance County. And so that, that's just my opinion, and it may be four to one or 155 to one, but I just, I just got to put that out there, me and my timid self, so. Uh, so a couple questions. Uh, you said that you're, you're asking that we extend this to the end of the year. Do you mean the calendar year or the fiscal year? I, I'm saying to the end of the calendar year. End of the calendar year. Let's and then hope that, I mean, if it, if, 
I'm, I'm doing that in hopes that we won't need it by the end of the year. If we did, we'd come back and ask again. Okay. Does the county have any idea what percentage of county employees are vaccinated or not? I would guess we do not. not. We have not asked those questions. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can. I don't think you can. I think you could do an anonymous survey. Mm -hmm. I would. But you can show your COVID card anywhere to get in. Explain that to me. Mr. Chairman, I, I wonder if, if we might hear from the sheriff about his rationale for the uh, for sheriff's well, office. I wonder. If, I, I was interested, in the Sheriff, in your uh, your thoughts and rationale for vaccinating for for the uh, deputies being vaccinated. Well, we don't. You know, we have quite a few that haven't been vaccinated, and uh, we have clusters of COVID in our jail right now. And my biggest problem is the individuals that are in the jail. They don't have a choice to get out exactly and go and uh, you know I don't think we should have to order anybody uh, to to be vaccinated like she said but I also think uh, and this is what I thought we all discussed in a, in a meeting uh, with some of the county people that uh, you know you uh, people that are not vaccinated uh, get medical leave, but yet they're the ones that's bringing it in. I mean, we are jail. It was brought in by a person that was not vaccinated. And that bothers me a little bit, the fact that well, I'm responsible for every one of those people in the jail, and they can't get out of them sales. Yeah. And so, you know, but I'm going to follow whatever the county says. I'm going to follow what the county says. And if we lose every officer to COVID, somebody's going to have to come run that jail. <laughs> We're going to work it. Mr. Chairman, I might suggest we break this up into two motions. Unless it's... You have the floor. All right. Uh, <laughs> you should... We appreciate you, Craig, because you kind of really help us with this. Right. Uh, the, the first motion would, would apply to all county employees except for the sheriff's office, and that we, uh, we accept Ms. Hook's uh, uh, proposal uh, not requiring w without regard to vaccination status well, let me slow you down do we even need a motion as to the sheriff he's on his own is he yeah. not he's, he's yes. we, don't, we, we don't have to vote on that at all no. well no we don't i'm gonna be honest with you it's gonna be hard for for our people not to follow county policy or go against so whatever the county says but i want y'all to, to understand you're ready if it if it breaks out you know it's, it's not unlike anybody else in the county building. Uh, well, Sheriff, how do you uh, what, how do you um, feel about Miss Hooks? Just said she had some folks who had been vaccinated who got COVID. I mean, what what happens? What, what do you do then? What What do you do then? Uh -huh. I guess you know. Hey, uh, would you pay them sick leave then? If, would they, I, were, if they've been vaccinated, I think they yes, they should. I I had looked at and we had talked. Mm -hmm. in a meeting that if they had been vaccinated and they get it then certainly they do it but if they're not vaccinated I think there was a discussion with uh, some of the commissioners and county manager not everybody at one time that if they wouldn't they wouldn't get it you know but I'm going to follow whatever the county policy whatever y'all say but I want y'all to understand what may happen at that detention center and you know I'm not trying to get you to change your mind but we already 47 people short. We've got I don't know how many on the, uh, COVID right now. This out. I think the purpose of this, if I may speak, maybe out of turn. You the man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're trying to encourage every everyone to do as much as they can to protect themselves and others. Uh, we are not in a position and do not want to require anybody to take the vaccination if they choose not to do so. I agree. On the other hand, we don't want to be paying somebody that chose not to, not to protect themselves and then get sick leave. Uh, I think that was the purpose of that committee. Right. You but may you have care. some young people that, like somebody in my family that's very young, and she hasn't started her family yet, and she don't want to touch this vaccine because she doesn't know anything like that. Do we all remember the Zika virus, Mosquito Festival? Pregnant women that were bitten by this had extremely deformed babies. So everybody has a, a, 
a right to have their own mindset about what is right for their body. I totally get you. I, I totally get you because I was interviewing guys in person and now through the window. And that is the smart way. But on the other side of that window is all these people on top of each other. This is such a wicked two-sided coin. Amen. I'm telling you, we just don't know what the heck to do. Because every time we turn around, we are having to change our mind. And just to open the can of worms, when we look really southern, and a lot of people are coming in with no vaccines, no testing, no nothing, don't you ever make me think that that doesn't spread this because of where everybody's going. So we're not in this by ourselves, and we're trying to do the right thing here. But, I mean, like I said. Let me mention one other thing. Mr. Oh, Chairman. That's part of the, excuse me one second. Um, additionally, there are exemptions built into this proposal mm -hmm for uh, medical reasons and or religious reasons. So they would be exempt and would be paid if in fact they did not have the vaccine. Um, so we, we try to be with this proposal as fair as we can be. I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, please. Yes, the young lady who spoke earlier called me this afternoon and I listened to her comments then and her concern was for frontline workers who might become exposed to the COVID vaccine and then be ordered to have to quarantine. DSS, health department, sheriff's department, EMS, and so forth. Um, at this time of the year, even the tax department, people bring in their tax payments. But they, if, if they get multiple exposures, you know, you, you all think that maybe you're only going to get exposed one time and you're only going to lose 10 days. But if you get multiple exposures, one of the issues that comes up is you could be exposed three times over a six month period or a two month period or a one month period. And back to back quarantines, which could mean 10, 20, 30 days or more in time away from work. So it's an issue for us to think about from the county perspective and staffing. It's also an issue for us to think about from reimbursement. It, 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 most of our employees don't have 30 days of sick leave, sick leave. Now, some may have a lot more than that if they've been with the county for a long time, but there, there are some very new hires probably that wouldn't even be able to start there. Well, Mr. Carter, also this limits it to 80 hours. Um, so you would not have a month or regardless of what we do, you would only have up to 80 hours, which is you know, five working days. Beg your pardon? Two weeks. You mean which 10 is, working days? Which yeah. is 10 working days, right, five <laughs> working days per week. That's correct. That makes 80 hours. Bill and I had the math, you had the law, right, John? Exactly. That's right. It can be if the weekend kicked in too. Okay, commissioners, additional questions? So, okay, A and B, what are you saying? Well, I don't know that there's a need for two motions uh, based on the discussion. So what are you saying now? Well, I, I'll, I'll move that we accept uh, Ms. Oak's recommendation for sick leave policy without regard to vaccination steps for county employees. Second. So what does that mean? That if you don't get the vaccination? Well, I, I don't know that it would apply to the, the sheriff's office. But. I'm not, I'm talking about the sheriff, but like if I work in human resources and I don't get the vaccine, for whatever reason, and I get COVID and I'm out, I'm just out, right? You would you would be covered by the sick leave policy. You would be. What about? What Are about? we making anybody get the vaccine? No, ma'am. Okay, Mr. Johnson. What about people that that are are in a position to be in presence of people with the virus? And they, you know, the health department trades it back. Do we send them home? I'm sorry. Come to the speaker. We're having yeah. trouble hearing you. Uh, for instance, uh, in, in our office, close working thing, back in the detention center, very close working. Person gets uh, the COVID. Okay, the, her fellow workers or his fellow workers just works that particular block with them. We, do we going to pay them to go home too? Because they're going to have to be quarantined. Yeah. I think, I think the way it would work, I'm sure you don't. Well, I, I think Tony can help too because I think that there are exceptions for some emergency workers 
And I think that the detention, detention center could fall under an exception, but Tony could tell me better. Sure, so, sure. so the way that the guidance work for those that are vaccinated, um, you do not have to quarantine for 14 days. So case in point, in one of my service areas, we have some folks that are currently having to quarantine uh, for 14 days um, that have chosen not to be vaccinated in, in their choice. Um, but that impacts our service, our frontline response, um, and the way we see and serve customers. Um, so, but if you are vaccinated, you do not need to quarantine for 14 days unless you develop symptoms and then the story obviously differs and we'll actually get tested and make sure that COVID did not develop. So that's what you would do if you found, found someone who uh, contacted, you would have them tested if they've already had the vaccine and they if, come in contact with someone So if with they're COVID. a close contact. Would you test them? You would test them? Only if they're symptomatic. If you had no symptoms. If, um, so, so I'm gonna use myself as an example. Uh, mm -hmm. I am currently a close contact. I am vaccinated. I do not have to quarantine for 14 days. And if you had not been vaccinated, you would be quarantined. I'd be for quarantined. Days. I'd, I'd be on the screen currently. Even yes. though no symptoms. Even long, even yeah, no, with no symptoms, correct. Now, if symptoms develop, then that escalates to a new, new game. Oh. No, no symptoms. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, just for public information, because I've had several questions, uh, where te where is testing going on currently? So. Um, it's on our website. I couldn't, couldn't tell you where it's at it. each day. <laughs> exactly it's on our website, but you can go to also to CVS, Walgreens, okay. Cohen's Got Places, Urgent Cares. I mean, there's there's a lot of testing okay. out there for folks. I think Harris Teeter, Walmart maybe too. Harris right? Teeter has They're, a wine bar. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> but testing is crazy. Results? Did you wait for your results in the <laughs> Now let me ask one more question. All right, if you've got an employee non-vaccinated in close contact they're out for 14 days not symptomatic out 14 days what happens if they become symptomatic after the 14 days we're only going to pay them one time sure they're sure. going to be out the next 14 days because of covid because they were not vaccinated and because they've already received their 80 hours correct right so that that scenario they would obviously get tested and if they tested positive for COVID then they would be out an additional 10 days or possibly longer depending when their symptoms resolved if they um, tested negative then it would just be up to their physician to say do further tests and of course go from there yeah. so the real purpose of this is to try to encourage not mandate the vaccine strongly encourage yes yes sir and that's what the health department would recommend. Yes, sir. Well, we've been strongly encouraging people. I mean, you, it's everywhere to get it, and people are making those choices. And now we appear to be financially making a choice for them. Like, if you don't get the vaccine, no, no, no. I mean, and I get both sides. Both sides are right. That's the problem here. So. Mr. Chairman, I have a quick question for the sheriff. Please. Uh, Sheriff, if yes, I understand, your primary concern is for the detention center. Is that right? Well, it's really concern for the whole sheriff's office because we're back and forth detention center, mm -hmm. but mainly detention center. And well, particularly with the detention center, you're concerned that if there's an outbreak and you have detention center officers who are not vaccinated and too many of them are quarantined, you'll have trouble running the detention center. That's, that is one concern. Another concern is if we bring, a person is not Vaccinated comes into the detention center, works there, and gives it to an inmate. The inmate dies. Who's going to be liable? Was the inmate vaccinated? Do what? Is the inmate vaccinated? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. And so that there's a public, there's a public safety issue with respect to the detention center. There's a public health issue with respect to the detention center. Is that yes? Is that fair, Mr. Albright? Is it is it possible for the county to have different? Uh, policy based upon public safety, public jobs, public emergency uh, for, for those reasons? It is. And the, as an elected official, he gets to decide what that policy is in the jail. And the Register of Deeds as an elected official gets to decide what the policy is in his shop, Clerical. as does the DSS Clerical. board and the health board. I mean, they can, oh God, I'm on that board. Because they provide different services. Yeah. Right. I sit in my 
law office all day and I Zoom meetings now. I rarely run into people. And it's different from somebody who's at the health department who's actually giving people shots, taking temperatures, examining them. And the sheriff's office, when they're escorting their guests to dinner <laughs> and to exercise and back to their cells. So so sheriff, totally if, different. If the board had passed a, a motion uh, that had one policy for county employees but allowed you the discretion to do what you wish with the with, uh, sheriff's office and detention center, would that meet your approval? Well, it's, it, it, yep, uh, but at the same time, you got to think about what if you are a county employee working for the sheriff, paid by the county, and old Joe over here gets 14 days being exposed to it, you've been exposed to it, and get, or you get it and you don't get paid. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it's not an easy solution, it's folks. Not. But Mr. Albright, we don't make the policy for the Sheriff's Department, correct? No, you don't. No. Thank you. He does it. It's his show. But they are paid by the county. Mm -hmm. Yes. When old Joe over here is paid by the county, gets his 14 days, and you don't get paid, and we already, oh well, I'll follow the policy of the county, and we'll do whatever has to be done from there. I don't have a problem with that. I'm, you know, I just, it's just a different situation for the inmates locked behind bars and our people. A lot different situation. Sheriff Jones. Yes, sir. Boy's out of the middle of the air, right? Can you not tell where I'm coming from, right? <laughs> um, question for you. Are, are we giving I think I remember getting the answer to this before, but I want to make sure I'm right. Aren't we giving vaccines to inmates if they request them? Yes, sir, if they request them. Uh, and we're testing everyone that comes in that jail. We had two come in last week, tested positive. Well, we can't throw them out the door. You know, we have to hold them. Are we offering the vaccine to them when they come in if they yes, haven't sir. already been vaccinated? Yes, sir. Count the department okay. has been worked on yet. Been, been working with us to uh, inmates need vaccination or request vaccination they can be vaccinated thank you yes sir again Ms. Huck there are exemptions for medical reasons and religious re uh, reasons built into this policy is that correct there are but the I, I do want the board to understand that me not being comfortable getting the vaccine is not going to give them an exemption. That's not an accommodation. I understand. So, but yes, we would make accommodations for medical and religious re reasons, just like we would. It, it falls under the Americans with Disabilities Amended Act. What so. kind of religion doesn't want a vaccine? There are some. There are Baptists. some. Baptists. Oh, we do yeah. not. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, he wishes to strike that remark. <laughs> well, I'm Baptist. That's why. I that's said. right. <laughs> okay. I'm all right. I, I I'm good. I'm good. I'm just okay. Uh -huh. I'm going to make a motion that we approve this this policy as written. Do I have a second? There's Craig. no second, it fails. I think, Thank uh, I think Craig, I think Craig, didn't, didn't Craig make a motion to start with? It wasn't second. He was thinking out loud. Oh, see, so I thought you made a motion to start with. Yeah, I didn't have a second. I thought we had a motion on the floor as well, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, me too, I'm sorry. I, I thought you made a motion and, and then asked the sheriff a question. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, let me this make sure that I understand. I thought his motion was contingent upon exempting the sheriff's department, which we can't do. Uh, what what is your motion? Well, my my single motion was uh, to approve Ms. Hook's plan without regard to vaccination status for county employees. I'll say that that that, that the county. I, I agree with that. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know that we have the authority to, to direct that with respect to the sheriff, but no. Nope. Other than that, and other than the, the sheriff's parade, parade. Yeah, that's his that's his parade. He right. gets to decide what he wants to do. And that's fine with me. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Me. No. So we have two 
Yes is two no's. Mr. Carter, what is your vote? Yes, sir. All right. So we have three yeses and two no's. Who are the Thank two you. no's? Who's the other no? You and I. Okay. Me and John. Okay. What was the motion again? I'm sorry. To accept her proposal. Mm -hmm. To accept her proposal. Without the vaccine requirement. Without the vaccine requirement. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, take a break. Yeah. yeah. We're going to take a 10 minute break. Thank you. We're back in session. Three times. In order to pay back count. Hey, can we get that? I'm report? sorry, we're back in session. Yeah, let's get that report out. Do I need it's to about ask, time. Do I need to ask you, um, Chairman Paisley, about um, the vote we just took? Because I was totally confused. And um, I would like to see if we could redo that again. I think that's up to the uh, gentleman who made the motion. Um, I, I'll reopen the, the uh, matter, uh, Mr. Chairman. You were the second. Yes, agree? sir. Yes, sir. I totally agree. Right. Thank you. Commissioner Turner. All right. I don't have any more discussion. So, are we voting, Mr. Albright? Well, uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Thompson has asked that it be uh, reconsidered. And so now is the appropriate time to vote. I was confused because I just want to make sure that nobody is discriminated against based on their vaccine. Is that how I need to say it? And I just misunderstood. There's been so many things tonight, and I just want to make sure I get this right. All right. As I understand the motion, the motion is to allow the sick leave, regardless of vaccination, for up to 80 hours, and we have a written motion. The only thing you're removing from the written motion is the requirement to have the vaccine. Is that correct? Correct. All right. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, no. I think they ought to have the vaccination. Thank you. I understand. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, it's four to one. Okay, Mr. Haygood. Item 9.1. I think Ms. Evans is going to present this uh, for us this evening. Good evening again, Commissioners. I'm before you tonight asking your approval to designate funds from the fiscal year 2021 budget for projects that are ongoing that we would like to complete in um, fiscal year 21-22. For the general fund, that would be $2,811,460.38. And for the landfill fund, we're requesting $616,573.54. Um, also within that designation, we are asking, um, this is something that we do every year for ongoing projects so that we can continue those. Um, it's part of our fiscal year in close. And also what we're asking for is our soil and water department. Um, they have a no-till drill program and what we would ask is that those funds would automatically be designated at the end of the year and we wouldn't have to continue to bring that back um how that pro how that program works is we have farmers who come in and they borrow this this no-till drill um, they pay a rental fee and then soil and water is able to use that rental fee for the maintenance and the upkeep of that equipment um, so we would ask that just to be a perpetual um, year-end designation we wouldn't have to bring that before you each year um, as you can see from our list we are asking for about 2.3 million dollars of pandemic response funds four hundred thousand dollars for ongoing legal cost fifty five thousand eight eighteen seventy one for ongoing maintenance um, construction and process projects sixteen thousand seven hundred thirty six dollars and sixty eight cent for cip projects at our parks um, two thousand two hundred eight sixteen dollars for veterans that was for travel that was just now done and completed um, dss is requesting ten thousand dollars to be set aside for the opening of the petri building for their visitation uh, program and then soil and water we've talked about that and then another eleven $1 hundred dollars for soil and water for um, future program costs for our landfill one hundred fifty five thousand would go to their convenience center project which is in process $34,561.64 is for the Swepsonville post closure process and project. $383,488, the convenience asphalt repair that's in progress, and an additional $43,523.90 for the new sale as they'll work through um, 
permitting and prerequisite work. Board, any questions? Mm. Motion to approve. Sorry. Any further discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, landfill. Mr. Hill, good to see you. Good afternoon. I'll try to make my math simple. So two points in front of you tonight. One, asking for your consideration to award a bid for the repair work on the tarmac at the landfill. Um, Mr. Turner has asked me to give a little backdrop into that, so we'll do that in just a minute. And the other part of this is how we're going to pay for it, part of which Susan just uh, commented on with the 383000 so um, the asphalt that was in question is the entry road into the landfill and the area that everybody considers the convenience center. That's where your recycling and your throwaway baggage um, work happens. That's almost entirely residential. So this isn't so much a commercial part of our uh, job as the uh, residential. Tarmac was put down in 1993, has never been resurfaced. Uh, there has been some patchwork done over the years. Uh, there doesn't seem to have been a lot of effort made when it was originally constructed to eliminate ponding of water. So in the winter time, we get a lot of slick surfaces freezing, which tends to cause alligatoring of, al of asphalt as it does in your highway system. <clears throat> We've got some safety issues. Uh, this asphalt is coming apart and uh, there's a lot of curb work that needs to be done and integrated into the engineering of this project is surf surface water control. Again, that was not put in originally. Um, we can go off on a tangent, but the Department of Environmental Quality is starting to have conversation about having this water regulated. So the fact that we're doing this now allows us to control it. So if that comes to fruition, we have a much better, cheaper ability to, con to control uh, that aspect of our work. Any questions about the asphalt, where it came from, and why it needs to be repaired? When will you do this? I mean, will you guys, you won't be closed or anything, will you? Well, um, <laughs> county manager would request that we not close at all, mm -hmm. and we're going to make every effort to do that. We're a seven-day operation. Yeah. The reality of it is somewhere in that project, <laughs> we're going to have to have two to three days that we close the main road. You simply can't replace asphalt with commercial traffic on top yeah. of it. But outside of that, we have already met with who we believe the contractor will be, working with their engineering company, and setting about things and parameters that we can do to continue to operate on a seven-day operation. There will be disturbances to the public, just like if you're going down a highway and they're doing asphalt work. But we believe we can continue to operate with the exception of probably those three days. That's awesome. It, it'll be difficult and it will be aggravating. Well, there's a lot expected for you to have to do and that's, that's awesome. It will be a seven day operation. We would do part of this work during the day, part of this on the weekend, part of this at night. Mm -hmm. um, so there'll be a lot, a lot going on. We, um, we bid the project. We had three responsive bids. They ranged in price from the low of 678,000 to a high of one, almost $1.2 million. Part of that escalation in price is all the things you've heard tonight, yeah. materials going up. We have a little bit different issue in that the amount of money needed to be spent for manpower trying to do a project 24 hours a day also escalates the price. So the $400,000 that we're having moved over from last year helps pay for part of this. And then the rest of the um, money can come from one of two options we can talk about. Okay. So bar construction was the winner of the low bid. Uh, again, we've already met with them. Um, they're ready to go. They believe they could get started sometime right after uh, Labor Day break. Concerning paying for it, 
Um, we've asked for two additions to the bid price, um, a 5% contingency. That's simply because we're digging up under the ground and you never quite know what you're going to find, right? We hope we've done our homework and we don't see using that money, but we feel better having that 5% there. So that's calculated. It also includes $37,000 for engineering oversight by municipal engineering. Again, we took a worst case. We asked them to price it as if it was a three month project. We have built into this contract a two month uh, completion, substantial completion. So again, we think we're overestimating the burden, but we'd rather do that up front. In totality, all that comes up to $749,100. That's bid, contingency, and engineering. To pay for that, as Susan mentioned, we're moving over $383,000 from last year. Uh, Andrea had originally set up in this packet that we would take, um, let's see, where's the numbers? We would take um, uh, $310,000 from the sale of timber. As you noted, last time we spoke, we are timbering 120 acres. The very good news here is those results came back Thursday of last week, and we actually got 435000 So That's we a had a, a delta gain of almost $125,000 there. Uh, originally, Andrea said that we would take $55,000 from this year's retained earnings. That's still an option if you want to do that. But we do have enough money now guaranteed in the sale of the timber to take care of the balance and stay away from, from savings. Did the timber sell, did it uh, change because you changed uh, folks you're dealing with? No, uh, Henderson Consulting, Forestry Consulting, did it for us. Um, I think it's the reversal of all the things you've heard tonight where we're paying more mm -hmm. for things. Well, in this case, we're getting more money because things are costing more. And I Henderson did a very good job laying yes, it out. I, uh, I made a few phone calls to uh, friends that I know own sawmills in the mm -hmm. western part of the state mm -hmm. and the eastern part of the state. And that's one of the questions I was going to ask you is 310 enough, and I'm glad to see you got more because I was instructed that we should get more based on some of the, the wood that's on the land. So right. it's good to know that we're getting some more money on there. Right. Because I know the sawmills right now are loaded up. Yeah, we had another contention in this, and that this work also parallels to building that new sale, and there's several acres of land that we need to have timbered early so we don't lose the value of the timber when we start building the new sale. That's kind of against the rub as logging companies do things. They like to buy the rights and do the work two years from now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we mandated that a certain area had to be timbered early before March the 1st of next year. There was a concern that would decrease the value, but it doesn't seem to have. Yeah. Where's, where's this company out of? It's a local company. Almost awesome. Yeah, it's even better. local. Triangle Forest, with Triangle that, Forest Products. Is Rhett Davis with that company? I think he is. Rhett works with Henderson Forestry Consultant. Rhett came out several times, walked the lamb with us, and held our hand and did all the good things that Rhett does. Right. <laughs> good man to have on your team. Absolutely. 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 Paul Bunyan. So again, tonight, if you are agreeable with one of those two methods of paying for the project, and then to give the okay to go forward with signing a contract. Mr. Haygood, I think we need two separate motions. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, are you taking that 55 out and putting it back in your savings? <laughs> That'd be part of the second motion. Okay. Y'all, I'm just overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> so much money. <laughs> Mr. Oh. Quick question about it. Mr. Mr. Sure. Uh, just want to cover the uh, the difference in um, in the budget amount and the and the actual amount. Mm -hmm. Pretty significant. I mean, 432 up to so, 750, almost 300,000, well, over 300,000. Part of that is obviously cost going up because of all the things we've talked about. But in addition, recognize that the 400000 approximately that was put there was an accumulation over a year or two of funds that we derived from other projects at the landfill and put them together. We never had a, an obvious quote, a real quote 
for those services. Okay. We were accumulating money, doing the engineering to see what it would cost. We only bid that project this summer. Okay. So it's a combination of not having a previous bid, not knowing really what the cost was going to be, and then the escalation of construction costs. Was the prior number sort of a placeholder because that's how much money you had? Yeah, it's not uncommon, and Susan can talk about this at Andrea, that when you have money left over, we'll move it to another capital fund to try to offset having to come back and ask for it for, for other reasons. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Haygood, would you state the first motion as proposed? So the uh, first motion would be to amend the fiscal year 21-22 landfill budget by $749,100. That would be to pay all costs anticipated for the asphalt repair project, uh, and that would be using the funds that were just designated uh, a moment ago by the board with the balance coming from timber sales, not using the retained earnings, all the balance coming from timber sales. I'll make, have a motion. I'll make it. We have a motion, uh, Ms. Thompson, More second? Helmets. I'll second. All right. <laughs> motion second. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 It's 5 -0. Thank you. Sounds like he's Okay, and the second motion would be? Uh, the second motion would be uh, award the construction bid to Bar Construction Company Incorporated for $678,000, authorize the county manager to execute all necessary documentation. I'll make a motion. I'll second. Yeah, a motion second. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Again, Fabo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. You always do such a great job. Okay. Um, is oh, you're here. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Candace Scoble. I'm the assistant director of operations at the Department of Social Services. I'm here tonight to request a budget amendment. In June of this year, 2021, um, the Department of Social Services entered into an agreement with Cardinal Innovations, which was considered the Child Welfare Reinvestment Agreement. Um, through this agreement, Cardinal agreed to provide our agency a subcapitated rate um, for Medicaid-eligible children who are in foster care or who are at risk of entering foster care. The payments are set to occur on a monthly basis, and this agreement is scheduled um, to the extent of June 2022. Um, the funds will be used to improve the systems of support for the family and children that we work with. Um, a few examples of how we would use these funds is to cover costs of specialized assessments for any children with special needs or severe trauma, upfitting family um, um, visitation rooms, or any travel expenses that a family may incur when they're working on reunification or obtaining custody of a foster child. Um, the initial payment that has been received does cover a retro period of June 2020 through July 2021, and the total amount that has been received is $1,175,260. And just to mention, there is no county match for this um, requirement, um, and what we're just asking is for the budget amendment to be approved and for the expenditure and revenue line to be created. Are there any questions? Just one thing, Candace, talking about foster care, how are we doing with the amount of foster parents related to foster children? So I don't know that I am completely able to answer mm -hmm. that as I work more on the operation yeah. side, um, but that is something that I'll be happy it's to a take concern, a look at. I'm I do sure. know that they are continuing, continuing with their MAP classes mm -hmm. um, and working to get as many foster parents as we can. Great. I have one other question. I, yes, I don't think this is even in your area. Uh, visitation centers mm -hmm. in domestic cases, are they available? And if so, who provides that service? So I am not 100% sure on that. I know for those that are in our custody, we do have a visitation room at our agency. Um, we're also fortunate for the Petrie or the Ivy building. They are having some visitation rooms that are being created there that we are able to use. Um, I do not know of any other ones off the top, but I'll be happy to, to take note of that and get you the answer. I would appreciate it. Okay. If for, a lot of times the judges in domestic cases will order supervised visitation, and that specifically is what I'm inquiring about. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Do we have a motion? 
I'll make it. I'll second. Well, again, there's no county match. That's correct. All right. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, again, 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, no public speakers, Madam Clerk. No, Mr. Chair. Are there any county commissioner responses? Since there are no speakers, I assume no. No. Okay. Mr. Hager. I do have a few items for the commissioners to consider this evening. Uh, first of all, I want to do a quick ARP update. Uh, we're going to try going forward to do uh, an ARP update, possibly an item on the agenda, if not a lot to cover, at least during the county manager's report. Uh, the first meeting of every month going forward uh, uh, starting this evening. I wanted to make sure the commissioners knew that uh, after our last meeting, uh, staff contacted the local government commission to talk to them about uh, the possibility of uh, using it was three million two hundred forty thousand dollars I believe of ARP funding to reimburse the county for expenses we had incurred that we believe are ARP eligible from March to June of 21 uh, the LGC has indicated to staff that they had no concerns about reimbursing uh, the county reimbursing itself with those ARP funds uh, they did indicate to us that we of course must follow US Treasury guidance so we would have to make sure that we're able to demonstrate that those costs that were incurred during that time period meet uh, ARP eligibility and uh, we were concerned about the fact that it may make our audit late. The LGC indicated to the staff that they would allow a separate submittal of just this action. So our audit for the county could still be done, still be done on time, but this would be like a separate, uh, a separate submittal to the LGC. And they offered to work directly with our auditors if that is needed. So that's great news. Mm -hmm. Will allow us to proceed forward with, we're gonna fine tune the dollar amount, $3,240,000 of what we believe is accurate. We're going to be working between now and September 7th to fine tune that and come to you um, uh, with the final reimbursement number on September the 7th. And uh, that's good news because the commissioners can then take those dollars and you can do whatever you want to with them. You can designate them if you like in any way that, that you want. Uh, I think uh, we're, we're planning going forward to also review county expenditures in this current fiscal year. For anything that could be eligible for ARP, and that would include our pandemic response fund. The board just approved designating uh, $2.3 million in pandemic response fund. Those are former CRF monies that we got in the height of the COVID pandemic that we uh, supplanted county dollars and have been using ever since to do things like pay court screeners, do uh, testing and clean uh, the jail in our current county buildings. Very important dollars to have. So. We feel very certain that some of those costs that are budgeted this year with pandemic response funds could be used with ARP. We're going to go forward identifying those and come back to you and give you the option if you want to spend ARP dollars that way. Same thing with uh, some of our other county expenditures in this fiscal year. To at least give the board, uh, as we go, an idea of how you might spend ARP money to put it in a designated fund that if you then wanted to do ARP projects with, Again, as we said last time, these dollars would not have the ARP restrictions on them, right? You would have spent it compliant with ARP. You could, if you chose, to designate it, put it in the pandemic response fund, and then if you, I know we have lots of projects to think about for ARP money, you could use these funds for that without having to worry about the ARP eligibility piece. So um, we'll, we'll be bringing you some numbers on um, September 7th. Uh, for you to vote on about art. But I thought it was good news that the LGC indicated that uh, they don't have any issues with us going forward with the $3.2 million reimbursements. Um, so I do bring an item to your attention that uh, came to my attention late last week, particularly uh, involving our EMS department. I've talked with, uh, Sherry and I both have talked with EMS staff. The leadership at the department indicates that staffing at EMS is very thin. The department has 96 full-time positions. We currently have 19 vacant. Uh, those are vacant for many reasons. Uh, some for injury, some are just vacant that we cannot recruit people to, um, to, to uh, come and work for us. That's about 20% of the full-time staff uh, being unavailable. It's been difficult. I think we have Ray Vipperman with us tonight. I wanted Ray to be sure and be here so he can speak to any of this or answer any questions the commissioners have. Uh, I'm understanding from EMS that it's been difficult to recruit new medics. In a COVID world, I think uh, that has had a, a, a real bearing on people's interest in joining this field. Mm -hmm. right? You're putting hands on COVID positive folks uh, quite often. It's, uh, I understand from Ray that they are uh, finding themselves required to park ambulances on an almost daily basis, which is not good. 
Uh, we have a peak time ambulance that we run. I believe it's a 12 hour shift ambulance, peak times, as well as we run two convalescent ambulance units every day. Uh, Ray and the folks are finding that we're having to park that peak time truck on a regular basis and oftentimes parking one of our convalescent units. Obviously, this affects our ability to get ambulances to citizens in need. So I've talked with Ray and uh, he is requesting that the commissioners consider an incentive uh, pay to full and part-time employees at EMS to encourage them to take extra shifts, right? So we're down right now. We're trying to encourage full and part-time employees at EMS to take extra shifts beyond their own. I believe uh, it's a, the proposed rate is $100 per shift for an employee that takes a 12-hour shift, $200 shift bonus for an employee that takes a 24-hour shift. I would suggest to the commissioners that we would pay this from our pandemic response fund. So uh, we would look at doing offering this to EMS full and part-time employees between now and the end of December. That's a four-month period. The estimated cost for this would be between $170,000 and $240,000 between now and the end of December. That's if people take these shifts and respond to this uh, opportunity in the way that we hope. How much was that again? 170000 to 240,000, it could be anywhere between that. We just don't know what, what folks will take. Again, uh, I would suggest we take this from pandemic uh, response funding. And I think, Ray, I'd, I'd like to give you an opportunity if you want to, to speak to some of the difficulties EMS is facing. I know if you look at the reports that we provided to the commissioners this evening in the packet, you, uh, the, the finance and management report includes the most current turnover information that the department has, I mean, that the county has. You'll notice that our top six turnover positions, detention, paramedic, and the other four are all DSS, right? So right now in county government, the departments that are in crisis from a turnover and staffing perspective are EMS and DSS. The commissioners have uh, done a great deal to help the, the sheriff's department because they were right there also, detention and deputies. And we've, we've stepped up and tried to, to help those departments. Last meeting, the commissioners did approve the bonus program for uh, DSS, which we certainly hope will be uh, stop at least the bleeding at DSS. I think there's an opportunity to try to do this this evening. I, I certainly realize these are not long-term best practice solutions. They are not. But I think uh, anytime I hear from Ray that we're parking trucks, Ray can attest, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, very worrisome. And I'm, I'm a little concerned that EMS is going to get to the point where they're going to be struggling to get trucks out of bays. So, uh, Ray, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add about what's going on. Yeah, just to echo what Brian said, you know, staffing has been difficult for the last several years, uh, in including uh, prior to COVID, and worked with the county manager a lot and done some great things uh, through you all with the um, uh, elimination of the fluctuating work week and, and then some of the cost of living raises and some of the merit that we've had. Uh, but when we entered the COVID uh, pandemic a little bit down with our staffing, uh, recruiting became even more difficult. Some colleges delayed, a lot of services weren't accepting clinicals, so you had a big delay. So what we're really meeting is just a difficulty in recruiting paramedics right now. Um, you know, into where we used to get a lot of applications for vacancies, we're getting fewer. Uh, we're getting a lot more inexperienced EMTs, which is the lowest level of training, uh, which is good, but you've got to have those, those paramedics staffed as well. And so uh, we're just looking for a way to, to incentivize folks to, to take some extra shifts, but also to reward those that have stepped up because we've had a bunch of folks that have have really stepped up and worked a lot of extra shift and have taken the commitment on and our supervisors spend about all their time working on staffing and, and you know it's, it's been a tough 18 months for all of our folks they have they've met the challenge they've met it head on you know they've gone into the when this was brand new and nobody knew what was going to happen you know we asked our folks to, to run into the house and, and meet it and they all did and, and uh, so we're very proud of them but uh, we want to get them some help to because the fewer trucks on the road, the more calls per truck have to be run, and, and so the workload just goes straight up. And I, I would add, commissioners, that uh, throughout COVID and continuing today, EMS has worked with a private ambulance provider to help us out with our convalescent service. That is something that we work with the county attorney's office to make sure we would be able to do through our franchise agreements. So we tried to do that to make sure that we we stay on top of convalescent transports. I mean, that's not emergency transport, but it is very important. If you've got loved one waiting for transport to doctor's office or to or from hospitals that is as important as you know to you as a, a, a emergency service so they have done that they've also this past weekend i understand had to 
uh, worked directly with rescue to try to get the rescue staff to be able to help the department get trucks rolling, right? So they're, they are doing what they can to get qualified people in the seats. Uh, it's just, I uh, feel like, and again, I, I don't believe that this or what we did for DSS last time is, is the long-term yeah. best solution. It is not. Uh, but I think these two departments are, are at a point that we do this uh, as we did for, for uh, similar for DSS. The hope would be that it would help, but I do think for both DSS and EMS at some point we're going to have to look at their salaries and uh, see what we can do. I have one question. Yes. Um, oddly enough, at the coffee shop last Friday, uh, two Elon seniors, uh, one apparently is a certified EMS. Both of these individuals want to go into the medical field. Um, would it be possible for Mr. Haygood, you and I, to meet with the Elon College folks and see if they would like to intern or volunteer some hours? Yeah, we could certainly do that. All right. Absolutely. If yes. we can set that up, please, sir, uh, I can give you contact information tomorrow. And, and commissioners, I would say that you know we've been using pandemic response funding for these types of uh, you know, COVID-related costs. So I feel like that's a reasonable use of these funds because I do believe that, as Bray mentioned, we have done a lot to try to help EMS salaries. I think the work that we have done over the past two years has just been negated by COVID. I mean, it's it's it, it is unfortunate because I think if uh, I think it weren't for the pandemic. We would be in much better shape because so. of the work that we've done uh, to get their salaries up. But uh, anyway, so yes, we'll we'll make we'll make that point. Mr. Chairman, uh, four questions. Uh, when you say trucks, do you mean ambulances? Yes, sir. Um, when you're fully staffed, how many ambulances are available for county use at any moment? Uh, so we peak out at nine. So we have eight 24-hour ambulances. We have one peak hour ambulance uh, that works during our busiest hours, 12 hours a day. Right. And then Monday through Friday, we have two convalescent ambulances that work uh, 9 to 7. So 11 uh, during the week? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, um, at our very peak. And so we're having staff issues that we're having to park ambulances? Correct. That are not available for the county? Correct. How many? So most of the time it's that we'll park our peak time ambulance and then right. one of the convalescent ambulances and then as Mr. Haygood mentioned, uh, we've been working with PTAR at a high point. Yeah. Uh, so they'll come over and help with some of our convalescent volume uh, when they're available right. uh, to help offset what that other convalescent unit would do. And even when we have both of those on the road, uh, we'll still bring them in. So we're reducing the number of, of ambulances available when the, the population of the county is growing. We've got to address this. Yeah. We've got to address this. Absolutely. We can't have this. Um, Mr. Mr. Uh, Hager, what, what was the total uh, ask? Estimated costs for this, uh, these, these in shi uh, shift incentives, uh, we are estimating between $170,000 and $240,000. We just don't know what the response will be. Between that, now and when? Now and the end of the year, December 31. Uh, do we have a, do we have know how our pay for EMS compares to other counties, uh, neighboring counties? I couldn't speak to that with any certainty, like how we stack up against, I don't know. Uh, I know pay at EMS is an issue, and uh, you know, I don't know, Ray, if you have any idea off the top of your head. I don't, so we've done some comparative studies, but it's been a year or two, so I, I can't speak definitively. Okay, um, we can't park ambulances. Mm -hmm. um, so let's do this, uh, you know, my opinion, I'm one of five, let's do this, and, uh, and let's quickly come up with a long-term plan. To address this now, I'd like to second that motion and agree. Adding to that, as you have already said, come up with a long-term solution. I agree, absolutely. Any other comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the final item I want to touch on uh, is uh, recently uh, Commissioner Thompson, Tammy Crawford, our Veteran Service Director, and myself traveled to Kansas City uh, 1st of August and met with representatives from the Veterans Community Project, which I know all the commissioners are familiar with this trip that we've taken and you've had an opportunity to see information on, uh, on what uh, Veterans Community Project is. I've printed out a couple of uh, items to just pass out. Um, 
I'd say, I, personally, I was impressed with the operations of Veterans Community Project, very impressed with the uh, folks that work there and the services that they offer. Uh, we toured the outreach facility as well as their headquarters and their transitional housing, the tiny homes. And, uh, you know, what I took away from Veterans Community Project is they offer services for any vet, regardless of the amount of time they've spent in the service or their, or their discharge status, which is often important uh, uh, when, if folks are homeless or really struggling. Um, the community, Veterans Community Project provides housing and links to services, so they're more than just transitional housing. Um, they, work to, they work with vets to increase their income security. Um, the average stay we learned in their uh, transitional housing is 14 to 16 months for a veteran and one thing they made very clear was that the veteran must be moving up, must be constantly moving toward uh, being able to uh, stand on their own, right? So they're able to live in the housing as long as they're demonstrating that. Um, they're in the process of expanding to other cities. They're Kansas City, they're in Colorado, St. Louis, and, Saint, and Sioux Falls. Their next expansion will be in the fall of 2022, so they are looking to look where they might uh, locate. What they indicated to us they look for in a, a potential community is local champions, land availability for their, uh, their outreach center and their, their transitional housing, and then philanthropic support. So, uh, you know, we're, we're very early in this outreach to Veterans Community Project. I think it was a great connection um, with, with the um, with the folks there. I know we have, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Tammy Crawford is also with us, and I'm sure uh, Commissioner Thompson has uh, input to give. But uh, overall, very successful trip. Uh, I took away uh, and very impressed with the operation that these folks offer. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Thompson just. Uh, is Tammy on? Tammy is on. She's with us uh, via. Go Zoom. ahead, Tammy. Hey, can you guys hear me? We oh, yeah. can. Well, good evening. Well, I think our trip was very successful. It was an honor for me to see this group live. Um, it just really was very heartwarming. The leaders of the group were informative. They were real veterans, some of them combat. Um, they devised the plan that it works. It sustains veterans in the long run. Um, most of the veterans that come there, I assume, were in dire straight, sort of like the ones we had in Alamance County. I just want to give a quick example. I had one, an amputee veteran last summer in July sleeping in his car in a negative driveway. So I think of all the solutions this would bring to our county. I think it would not only be a benefit to the veterans of this county, it would also be an asset to the community. Um, there's already some interest that someone has contacted me with local VFWs that would like to invest in the community project if we do bring it to Alamance County. Um, I also think there will be lots of other support. Um, everybody that has seen it or heard about it is very impressed, very excited. Um, to me, there couldn't be a better way to invest our money. And after seeing this project, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to thank the county for allowing us to go because um, it was it was like Christmas 10 years from now for me. And um, to watch Brian Haygood do his job as county manager was absolutely just, it, it was just amazing to me. You're smart here, but you're really smart out of town. <laughs> and um, Tammy was had every answer for everything. And... Um, and it, it was just unbelievable. We met three veterans, and they were um, Jason, Vinny, you can imagine, and Ben. Ben's the one I've been talking to a lot. But um, Jason Candor was also, let us know, he was um, the former Secretary of State for Missouri. And he was um, asked by President Biden to lead the VA when he went into office this year. And he said no, he was staying right there with the Community Veterans Project because that's where he belonged. Um, all three of these gentlemen told us that they had um, Iraq and several Afghanistan tours, and when they come back, they needed a lot of help. They had some issues, and they knew that they were not by themselves, and that's why they really wanted to complete this. We, um, oh, I just, golly, you know me, I was, oh, man. So um, we went around, we got a tour of um, 
the homes, and I say home, not house, because of how solid these places are built. Everything about these homes were built with the mindset of a veteran. The beds were in the back, facing the door. And they were not near the windows. Outside of every home was an American flag. It was as you could eat off the grass. It was so clean. They had so much beyond community support. This is a nonprofit, so it's not like it's on our expenditures. Uh, they unbelievable what they did. They were in their fifth year. This place was a driving range and they got this land, took two years to kind of get it going. There's, it's so nice to come in when something's been proven and successful. You don't have to go through all these fires. And uh, I met several veterans there, and I met this kid, seven years old. And, I, and they, he come up to me and he says, what are you doing? And I said, well, we're here touring it. And he told me he lived there with his dad. His parents were divorced. And, um, and he, I said, how old are you? And he said, I'm seven. And I said, well, you're getting ready to start school. He said, yes, and I am brilliant. I mean, just come right out and said it, and I believe him. And so we were buddies. Everywhere we went, there he was. And, um, and it showed me how safe and secure he felt there with his dad. Um, I, I just, I've never seen anything like this and met any, I felt like I was hanging out with my son because they were so about the Army, the Navy, the Air Force Marines, they even tried to tell each other that their service was better than the other. Yeah, we go in first, and you come in and look pretty. It was hilarious. But um, they had us on a screen about that big, and they zoomed in on us. They knew how many veterans we had here, how many homeless veterans we have here. They knew everything about us. It was, I felt like the FBI was interviewing us. But they are on their game. And, um, and I thought about what this could do for Alamance County because they're looking for eight sites, and when they saw everything about us and they knew how committed we were they're very interested and they want to come see what we've got here and I cannot wait for y'all to meet them they're just amazing but I wanted to talk about veterans for a second um, because this is just an amazing place the center they had there had a, had a dentist that had donated all the equipment he and his son come there and done dental work for these guys they had a medical facility where doctors come there and done stuff for them you check ups they even had pet smart which had a place where these vets could come wash their animals because they do have pets there every angle is thought about because it's all governed toward the vet um and so but i something about this really made me really think about something i went through a couple years ago with my dad I know for two years I was at the VA hospital in Durham every Thursday for chemotherapy. My dad had multiple myeloma, and the chemo for that is a constant maintenance. It's just constant. That's just what it's going to be. And um, when I sat in on oncology, I met, it was like I was just in a, a hero seminar. I met um, Vietnam veterans who were so sick. They were so sick because of Agent Orange. I mean, they were so sick, but they never complained. I met Korean War vets, which that's what my dad is, and there weren't a whole lot of them because my dad will be 88 years old. He would have been tomorrow. But they were just right there, too. And um, I met a lot of Iraq and Afghanistan vets that were missing a lot of limbs. I met this young man that was in his my motorized wheelchair and he had his cell phone hooked to his Wi-Fi and everywhere he went is like earth, wind and fire wide open. And I guarantee if you cut that radio or that music off, you would cut his smile off because it was his very purpose. He, he just had to have that music and he just lit up the world everywhere he went. And I also met silent um, veterans that didn't say much. And I knew they constantly were there for all kind of reasons to be sick and plus all kind of other things that I'm sure traumatic experiences were constant like mind movies going through their mind all the time. And um, the service that they received was just phenomenal. And I, w I will never, ever forget this because it is a family that you form from people all over North Carolina that come there and you instantly become part of each other because of what you do. And, and I remember one vet that was a Vietnam War vet and he was so angry and he was so sick, just, just so sick. And every time I'd see him on Thursday, his favorite words were F, MF, and GD. That's all that come out of his mouth. He was so bitter. And he sat beside a gentleman that my dad also he was an Air Force vet, and he was about my dad's age, and he, was, he had all kind of illnesses. And, um, and he, I remember he told this boy, he said, son, he said, um, I could be just as angry as you, but I had to really get my head around where I've been because I knew it would control every day for the rest of my life. And he said, I kept calling him son, and he said, son, if it weren't for Christ, I wouldn't be here to start with. He said, I'm not preaching to you, but I'm just telling you, you've got to find that peace. And the, it was all like church, and I watched this young man just, um, just fight it, you know. But the next week, every Thursday, I come in, he was a completely different young man, and he migrated straight for this other veteran. 
And I thought he finally felt like he was safe and had support, even if he was still angry, which I don't blame him. I totally understand. But um, the thing about this is we've always, we don't really see that part of our veterans until we're in a hospital. And a lot of our veterans are not in a hospital, they're in a park sleeping on a bench because of whatever tragedy they've gone through, whatever choices they've made once they've gotten out of the, the Army or the Navy or the Air Force Marines or Coast Guard or anything. And um, for the fact that they really liked us, I mean, they, they didn't have a chance or a choice. Uh, because I told Ben, I said, I knew once you met me and I met you on that phone, I would get you in North Carolina. And um, we had everything that they wanted and more, and that made us a perfect fit for this. And I don't want to get ahead of myself because I got probably 100 people praying for this, but I just hope so. But um, I just think it's real important that our county doesn't always do the very same thing and play it safe. And uh, this is something that um, it, won't, it won't beat up a taxpayer over it. And that's the most important thing because it's self-sufficient. They had every kind of thing you can imagine supporting them. And they also referred people out. They don't do everything. The VA may come, what, once every two or three weeks to do like what Tammy would do with paperwork and all kind of things like that. Um, they had public transit that come by there because they wanted them to be able to not stay there all the time and just isolate. And I said, what about laundry? Because I was thinking they'd have a stackable washer and dryer. They said no, because if they have that, they'll never leave their place. So they slowly but surely are building them and they've got, they got everything. They had a food pantry, I'm telling you, to get these guys and girls back on their feet. And there was a family section that your children can live with you. And then there was a single. And they really had it divided out so everybody would feel like they were also part of a smaller unit in that. But um, what I saw in these three men was um, three guys that have been there and done that and know exactly where these guys are. And for um, Jason, the Secretary of State, <laughs> About flipped I thought you're kidding me but no these these guys have really heavy weight Vinny who's got his own barbecue sauce you can just imagine Joe Pesci um, he's precious he he was like mr. all about it and then when he got on that laptop he became oh my gosh CSI I've never seen anything like it they know their stuff and they knew us we didn't have to go out there and try and sell us they already knew us but they saw our compassion and our passion for it and I can't thank Brian Haygood enough and Tammy to be at the same table with them. It was a real honor for me to watch the brilliance of our leaders in this county and to know that this is not impossible. This is something that we can do because we are made of this in this county. And I think as many times as the soldier has signed up to go to war and come back, because you never come back from employment the way you go into it. Um, I saw that at the VA. I saw it, they wore it, physical and mental. I think it's time that we're standing up as a county for these vets to make sure that they have the opportunity to have that sense of home. They even had a group that made quilts that went on the edge of the bed that was all about them. I thought, Eli Whitney, them quilters, and women can do it. I was all over the place getting stuff to go in my village. <laughs> but it's because I know this county and I know the heart of this county. So um, I wish you all could have went with us. And I, I'm gonna tell you, we had three Uber drivers. Brian knows how to do an Uber now on his phone. The first gentleman was from Egypt, great guy. I said, where are you from? He said, where are you from? You know, but he was a super nice man. Of course, I asked him, do you live near the pyramids? Gah. And so the second dude was from Somalia and he was just as nice as he could be too. He had been there, what, seven or eight years? But the third guy was from our country right there, and he drove talking like this. I thought, we're going to die. So um, I'd bet on the two countries riding with next time, not this one. But um, we were very blessed to be part of this, and we met wonderful people in the airport, too. We were just magnets for veterans and talking about this. We were telling everybody about it. <laughs> we had, it was just so impressive. But um, these homes are built solid, and I wanted to read something to you guys that I got in church during Sunday school, and this is happening to me all the time. I've just got a mighty list, and it goes, Hey, Pam, I'm a licensed general contractor and been building homes for more than 30 years. I like the ideas and the drive you have with the veterans and tiny houses. If I can be of any assistance, I'd love to be so. Feel free to reach out to me. Good luck, and thank you for your hard work thus far. And I'm not going to mention his name because he may kill me. 
But um, I've had a lot of people to contact me on Facebook when I just shared some pictures and said, I want to be part of this. And that's this county. We work together so good. So I just really want us to work together for the men and women who have served us so courageously and just need a little bit of some support to get them back on their boots where they belong. Yes, thank you, commissioners, for allowing us to go, for uh, uh, providing the funding. And uh, I think it's certainly a very worthwhile effort to stay engaged with Veterans Community Project and uh, continue to work to try to get them to, to give all consideration to Alamance County as a future expansion spot uh, for their service. I think it would be great for the veterans in our area, and uh, I am sure that we will continue to, to stay engaged with them and try to try to bring them bring them here to scope the area out. So thank you. Thank you for sending us some allowance to go. Quick, quick question, Mr. Egan. What are next steps? So I think uh, we're, we're working to see how we get them to come here and actually take a look at our community and uh, visit physically. Uh, so I think that would be one of the next steps. And then I think uh, after that, we'd be talking about uh, that one of their next steps with a community expansion is like a, a letter of intent to kind of let the county and the community know what they would uh, do if they came here and what they might be looking for as I said local champions philanthropic support um, a property a site uh, so I think the main next step is to get them to come and visit us uh, and, and take a look at our community and if they were very interested in meeting folks mm -hmm. that live here now and are already engaged in providing veteran services now uh, in our, community in our, leaders big yeah. time they're about that because they don't want to fail and we don't want to fail, and that's why we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. But um, it's um, they, they've got it down to a science, and if we could be one of eight, I think that would put North Carolina just in our county, just what a star we would be for this, this population. We're so deserving. It would be a privilege, absolutely, if we could convince them to accept Alamance County as one of their veteran community projects. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Thank you. Oh, are there any commissioner comments? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just have one really quickly, but it involves a colloquy with uh, Mr. with you today. Uh, could, could you speak? We haven't had a full COVID uh, update tonight, but can you talk briefly about um, vaccination rates for children 12 to 18? Do you have a rough sense of how we're doing in the county about that? So. Currently, our vaccination rates for 12 to 17, um, we are just under 33%, uh, a little over 4,000. Not great. And while I'm not somebody that really wants to force people to take vaccines, I am for making it as available as possible and as convenient as possible for people who want to want to take it, who have you know a desire to do that. Um, has, has there been any discussion at any level about uh, particularly high schools? having a, a mobile unit or something to go to high school on different days, allowing parental consent, allowing kids to get vaccinated in, in that in that setting, and perhaps even allowing parents when they bring kids to school to do that? Yeah, so I believe we'll be at, um, I think we finalized the plans today. I, I have to go back to circle around tomorrow. Um, C-TECH uh, during parent-teacher night here in the near future to provide vaccines to the 12 and 17-year-old. Um, Early on, uh, Cohen was able to do some vaccination events at some of the schools. And then the last piece of it is absolutely, um, I guess a little bit different if we go into the schools, we have to have parental consent before we um, okay. give the vaccine. So we'd have to coordinate with the school and just come up with a, a, um, a, a plan to, to make C-TECH is great, but it's, you know, it's not where kids, most kids are. Um, it seems like if, if kids could just go into school and just walk into the gym and get and get a vaccine that would make it really, really easy and hopefully it boosts those numbers. Sure. Um, with obviously with parental consent. I think maybe we could, if we could look at that, maybe talk to some folks with staff at uh, the school board or the school, you know, the superintendent that might be. Absolutely. Good. We'll put it on our, in our planning agenda. I have two questions. Under age 12, is that anywhere at this point? So, again, the, the rumor on that will be October, November. Uh, I, I just looked at the, the ASIP, the, the committee that meets on the vaccinations on, on Friday, and that's when they're scheduled to meet again in October, um, assuming that they, that's part of their discussion. Um, I would also probably 
suggest that doesn't mean they can't schedule a meeting ahead of time to move it up. So that's always a possibility as well. Second question is, those with special circumstances, they're talking about a third vaccine. Where are we there? Yeah, so um, that was approved on Friday by that ASEP committee in the, in the FDA. Um, that third dose vaccine is for folks that are moderately moderate to severe <laughs> uh, immunity compromised. Um, so right now where we're at is we're waiting for the state to put a standing order from the medical director. And of course our medical director will either stamp the same approval or make some adjustments to that, to that um, standing order. And as soon as we have the standing order, we'll be able to deliver a third dose um, to those, only to those folks that have had previously had the mRNA, the Pfizer or the Moderna. So if you got Johnson & Johnson, we wouldn't be able to give you the mRNA vaccine at the of that. That's just the recommendation from the ASIP and the FDA. There's no data to support mixing and matching those vaccines. Anything else, board members? But you're talking about this age is parents would consent. Correct. Parents would, yeah, would consent. Like, it's in New York. Yeah, and, that, and that's specific to the schools. Now, state law is a little bit different if they come into the health department. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318-111A3 and 6, I'd ask the board for a motion to go into closed session to consult with an attorney employee or retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the public body, which privilege is hereby acknowledged and to consider the qualifications, compliance, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment, or conditions of initial employment of an individual public officer or employee, or prospective uh, public officer or employee, or to hear or investigate a complaint, charge, or grievance by or against an individual public officer or employee. Do I have such a motion? I'll make a motion for that. Do we have a second? Second. Yeah, motion second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, 5 0. Thank you. We are temporarily in closed session. Steve back on. Uh, looks like he's on. Yep. Steve, are you on? I, would, I, turn, it, I turn everything on when you guys. Okay. You may make it now. Are we ready? Oh, no. Have we got Steve? <laughs> I can keep yes. it right here. Oh, okay. Color is purple. I'd like yes, to make a motion that we close closed session. <laughs> I second that motion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, 5 0. Motion, motion to adjourn. <laughs> yeah. Come make your motion. I move we adjourn. All right, is there a second? I second it. Sounds good to me. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs>Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioners Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Grand. Typically, the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on Local Gov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at nc.com This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. 
Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.